before we begin, Ms. Keys Gamara has submitted a written request to virtually attend today's work session due to a personal conflict. All those in favor of approving this request? Ms. Tolan, Ms. Eismar Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Marin, Ms. Amesh, Ms. McLaughlin, myself, that's everybody. Um, so, uh, Ms. Keys Gamara, can you check your microphone? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, we have an assortment of staff here with us today, as well as uh, Harry Henderson, the uh, chair of our uh, advisory committee uh, for students with disabilities. Do you want to get us started? Thank you. It's good to see all of you again. Um, my name is Harry Henderson. I'm with the I'm the outgoing chair of the Advisory Committee for Students with Disabilities. Uh, this is my last term as chair of the uh, committee and it has been a wonderful two years uh, that I've uh, gotten to serve in that role and uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that particularly even here today we have um, Elizabeth Zielinski who is the incoming uh, chair of the uh, committee. She has been the vice chair for the past two years uh, on the committee as well. And we also have Ali Baldessari, who is our uh, recording secretary. Uh, we sometimes refer to her as Queen Bylaw uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, ACSD. Um, our good friends obviously are here also from, uh, uh, from DSS, uh, uh, Dr. Boyd and Dawn and um, a good, good friend of mine, uh, Mike Bloom here who has helped me in more ways than I can possibly count. And I also want to make sure that I would mention that our uh, liaison, Laura Jane Cohen, who is always incredibly helpful with us and particularly um, uh, passionate about these issues. Um, you have our report in front of you and you know we're, uh, in the interest of time, we'd love just to kind of to move probably into questions if you don't mind with it. Uh, we've had more than a few issues to have to deal with over the last year uh, with the committee and you know we're we know that you all have probably a number of questions that are associated with those issues uh, do the best we possibly can to provide those answers for you and uh, so I'm more than happy to provide uh, answers to questions thank you would anybody like to get us started Actually, would you mind, Harry, just for the public to maybe just go very briefly over the overview just so the public can hear it and then we can, sure. if you don't mind, just quickly. So we have, uh, our report is separated into uh, into a number of different uh, uh, sections per each of our uh, subcommittees that we have. Um, they are detailed and we have the listing behind us here for each of the recommendations. Uh, in the past, our recommendations have mirrored very carefully what we have, um, uh, what has appeared in the air report and other matters in the past. Um, essentially, uh, our report with regards to the committee charge, which was very specific as it related to uh, the public day sites, uh, and I will tell you, I think those truly are the crown jewels that we have in Fairfax County. I don't say that only because my daughter attends one of them at Key Center. Um, uh, she is entering 10th grade there, and I, even though I don't approve of that necessarily, that she's that old at this stage, um, we do, uh, uh, they do just amazing work. But our charge was very specific as it relates to uh, challenges associated with, uh, with referrals, with regards to uh, staffing and a number of the other issues. Um, there are a total of six, uh, 18 actual uh, recommendations that came out of that uh, specific subcommittee. The reason that there are so many in that is that that subcommittee focused so strongly into it. And I want to make sure I uh, thank our folks from DSS and particularly Dr. Boyd who um, allowed us to do some uh, surveying of staff that was there. Some of the results that came out of that, uh, those surveys were particularly eye-opening and a lot of that 
information is uh, contained in our recommendations uh, that are within it. Um, specifically, the numbers talk about issues associated with referrals, uh, creating a referral checklist, um, issues associated with flexible funding for uh, individualized educational materials, uh, recommendations uh, associated with help and funding from central office uh, to remodel former seclusion spaces uh, as it relates to um, uh, moving beyond restraint and seclusion, uh, increasing of support staff, uh, the need for Keen Kilmer to add BCBA to their full-time school-based uh, staff, um, discussing a need to uh, create better partnerships to train uh, special education uh, teachers and professionals uh, as it relates to our uh, public day sites and the life. You'll notice that a lot of these recommendations mirror a lot of the airport recommendations that came out. That is in part deliberate, but also it's a result of the years of work that our committee has worked on on these topics. We've heard these recommendations from our uh, staff members and from our parents over and over again. And so, you know, trying to stop, uh, improve retention of our special education teachers, improving um, uh, teacher development, teacher training, and things to that end. Uh, these are issues that we focus in in a significant way. Our folks over at uh, policy and regulations, uh, uh, probably the biggest issue that they have focused in on is the use of differential pay uh, to recruit and retain special education staff. Uh, this has been a, an ongoing issue and an ongoing topic for us uh, for a number of years. Um, uh, the creation of specific tuition reimbursement pathways. And again, you may notice here that a lot of this seems to mirror back to a lot of the recommendations that came in through AIR. Uh, as a result, um, improvement of mentoring uh, challenges, auditing of existing professional development requirements. Uh, all of these areas within uh, the policy and regulation side of things lay into much of what's involved with the uh, special education enhancement plan that I know you all have uh, been involved with. Um, our Student Achievement and Outcomes uh, uh, Subcommittee uh, particularly wants to, uh, I think they would highlight a need to establish uh, enhanced data tracking uh, systems to capture information about uh, 2E students. I know that is of particular interest, it's been out there. You'll notice a lot of the recommendations that come out of this are focused around data and data collection. Um, it, this has been an ongoing issue with regards to what we've seen, and I know Mike probably gets about 50 requests a week from me, and I, I'm only slightly exaggerating, I think, that number that are associated with data requests uh, that are involved, and I think the most common answer that I get back from Mike is, well, we don't really have that data segregated, or we don't really mm -hmm. collect data to that end, and I think a lot of what we what that subcommittee looked at and tried to find results for were associated in that particular area. Um, the folks over at uh, Family Engagement uh, and Community Outreach, uh, a lot of what you'll see with that is focused around uh, IEP uh, training and, and IEP issues, um, uh, improvement of access uh, for CSTARS, uh, Eligibility testing IEP documents and progress reports uh, have to be translated for all parents in a variety of uh, languages. Budget issues that remain a key challenge. Uh, budgets always equal priorities with any organization. And this has been an area I know uh, Laura McCockney of our uh, committee is always the one that is uh, pushing so hard on the issue of budget and budget uh, issues to that end. Um, and I think that that's an important issue. And then changes to the IEP methodology um, uh, for discussion and review. It, 
you will notice onto this that this is of I think a particular issue of concern that we've had over the last number of years, and you know I. Um, it is important for us to have adequate time on the ACSD to review and provide uh, effective response back to issues that are involved. That's more than just one person being involved. That needs to be a committee as a whole. We have 34 members on our committee. And you know they come with 34 different points of view, as you might imagine. And so for them to have a chance to understand the challenges and the issues that are out there oh, and to be able to effectively uh, provide the response. Ms. Kiskamara, your microphone is on. Uh, is, to provide, um, uh, is to provide thoughtful response back in a timely uh, fashion for it. Uh, I could probably go into a lot more detail into this that, I, I, uh, that are involved into it, but I, I, I'll leave it at that at this stage. Thank you for that overview. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Ms. Marin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson and Mr. Bloom. So I first want to address a few things that are not um, ACSD specific, I think, but more about the work of um, the advisory committees. And I know I've mentioned some of this before, but it's particularly relevant because the board just yesterday was talking about uh, governance and how we use work and how it's going to align with the strategic plan. And so as I'm looking at, as always, the very robust work of the ACSD, I see that on board docs it referenced many of the, or in your report, it referenced many other documents that are not linked into board docs. And when I look at our school board webpage about ACSD, it is not current with our information. I'm thinking about the data dashboards, Dr. Reed, that you've been putting together for all host of things. I'm thinking about, you know, I, I want to be able to go somewhere to look at what you're doing so that I can then talk with my colleagues about what's happening. So, you know, our school board office is staffed the way it is. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is something the superintendent can think about because this is information that we want to convey to you and the board will further crunch it, but it's clear that we're, you know, there needs to be a better system here. That said, I also um, did want to recall that last year, or it was last year, fall 22, I really appreciated that the Department of Special Services had created one document that included not only the questions, um, well, included the answers to ACS or responses, and I don't see that today. And so, again, as we start this, um, so, if, if, so I looked back at the fall 22, it was a nice, and I even commented at the time, it was very helpful, but I don't see that today. All I see is the three-page piece from ACSD. And so what I want to do is, can we set the stage here, because this is the first of many uh, committee work sessions, what is the standard for what the board's going to receive? Are we going to receive feedback on these reports per committee? Um, was that just a special thing for ACSD that one time? Just want to get expectations clear here. Thank you. I'm going to, Mr. Fresh, thank you. I'm going to defer to Dr. Presidio just for maybe some historical understanding, at least to know what we've been doing. And then I think, obviously, we're open to doing something different moving forward. And I think if, as we transition to policy governance, um, that might be obviously something to think about. So, Dr. Presidio? So I think it's definitely something to think about, certainly following yesterday's work session on policy governance. I think there's a lot of a lot more consistency we could probably bring to the process. Uh, for each of the committees, staff prepare a staff response uh, for each of the committees, but it looks very different depending on the committee. Um, so we don't have a standard format, a standard template for that, um, and that might be something that we might want to consider in the future. Um, historically, and you know, I've, I've worked with eight different committees in varying capacities. Historically, I think it's worked better in some committees than others, so some sort of, you know, discussion about what the board would like in terms of what's going to work best for the board I think would be helpful. But right now we're set to prepare those staff responses and send those to the board in August. Ma'am. I'd like to go back, Mr. Fish, because I didn't get to ask my content question. <laughs> if I could, too, we, we were delayed last year. In coming to you all, uh, we had a number of times where we were pushed um, pushed on the schedule. And so I would say this. Last year, we got responses back in a much more timely fashion than we did the year before, I think, was, was a challenge that we had. But I think one of the reasons that you may not have answers to these 
uh, responses is that versus last year was just the timing associated with it from last year. Well, on that note, so so far CTAC is scheduled for the fall, so that's my committee. Maybe we'll. So we're going to postpone the rest of this meeting for another day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we're going to do Miss Sizemore Heiser than Miss Corbett Sanders. Well, thank you, and um, thank you for this very detailed report and the recommendations uh, to your entire committee and Harry, just for me personally, because we have a long history. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, I want to point out a couple things that are really, first a question, I know the charge talked about evidence-based practices for public separate day schools, and I was kind of curious what your committee had seen in terms of the best practices around this. And I know a lot of school systems don't have their own public day schools, so I was kind of curious what you'd found. It's a, it's a good question about evidence-based issues, and that was particularly our, you know, I would tell you that Ali Baldessari, our um, recording secretary and our was heavily involved on our um, uh, on our uh, executive committee with regards to the school board charge. Um, what we've discovered, I think, throughout this year, was what probably is well known. We we spent a significant amount of time discussing mm -hmm. um, meeting, having meetings with uh, all the principals, all the assistant principals from each of the um, public day sites. We had field trips, I think would probably be the best way to kind of describe it was for our um, committee members to get out and have a chance to be to meet them. The issues associated with the um, uh, with the surveys helped us significantly to put data behind a lot of the theories that we had heard or anecdotal evidence that we had heard. In addition to that, I would say the communication that we had from the principals, and the assistant principals and from educators that were out there let us uh, what we would hear essentially is the referral process that is going on is creating a significant number of challenges that are within those particular areas where you know my daughter's been a key center from the time she entered into the uh, school but I that's probably not correct for everybody mm -hmm. to be involved into those particular areas and I think from talking to a number of principals, they came to the same assessment, which was, which was we're getting referrals for people that have spent a week and a half in some cases at a different uh, at a different school. That's not effective to be able to, uh, to come to solutions. And I think that that evidence is leading us to uh, to some serious issues that are associated with what needs to be done to both protect and also to continue to develop those public day sites. Um, there's a reason I call them the crown jewels, and it's, again, not just because of my daughter's uh, uh, placement there. It's because nobody else has this. Um, within my daughter's association, uh, the Williams Syndrome Association, we have friends in the, uh, the Loudoun uh, County Schools. They tell us all the time, we would love the opportunity to be in the similar school that uh, that Jackie said, and I think that that is both a credit to what we have, but it also represents a serious challenge that we have to be able to make sure that this special uh, ability that we have there is is maintained. That's why I wanted to ask that because it is very unique what we have, and I think it's important to lift that up that we are keeping many of our students here that other systems don't have that opportunity. But you know, I, I wanted to lift up a couple things. Um, recommendations 16 and 18 under the school board charge in particular, right? I think when you talk about the descriptions of programs, I think this is important because we are seeing, from what I'm hearing anecdotally, an uptick of students being referred and sometimes very quickly to these day sites. So I think it's beyond even the PSLs and case managers. I think our admin administrators really need to get a real good understanding of what these are and what these aren't. And all of our, like with the CSS sites or public day sites, right, and what's maybe more of a consistent process, Dr. Reed, especially as we're going to go into, of what are the steps school-based administrators, and maybe you have this, right, should follow in making these referrals, right, and from case managers to PSLs to school-based administrators, and what should be done before the referral is made. You know, I think there's, we do need a holistic look at 
what is being offered at these day schools and what is not and who's being served and who should be served. And if, if we have a gap in what we're offering and, and it doesn't fit everybody's needs, we can't keep shoehorning them into these programs, right? We need to find what can serve them best. So that's the other piece of 18 I wanted to lift up. I love this. This is probably one of my favorite things, which is not how can the needs of the students not be met, but how is the environment not meeting those needs? Because that's key. It's, it's about, I think, that we need to really look at all of our environments to see are they meeting the needs of our students now as opposed to maybe when they were designed. My time is up. I'll take a go back, but I wanted to lift that piece up. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much, um, Mr. Henderson and Ms. Um, Sazmar Hazard. One of the things that we've been working on during this year with, uh, we meet regularly with CSS administrators and um, AP and principal representation from FAESP, MSP, HSP, et cetera. Um, and the piece about that referral piece has been something that's been elevated regardless of the, the seat that you sit on on a bus, whether you're at a um, comprehensive school and you're saying, hey, when I refer, it's taking too long for somebody to come and observe, and I, this should be able to happen. If you're at a CSS, you're saying, hey, they're referring, and they haven't done all of these things. So everyone has concerns. Um, and as we've been talking about that, talking about this summer working on what's that process that can be very um, streamlined, clearly communicated so that it's not contingent upon which PSL you have, who has the louder voice in the room that's clear and consistent. And we've also been working on a draft matrix. Uh, we started specifically with Burke, Burke CSS um, in our special education settings um, that support our students that have social, emotional, and behavioral needs to talk through the various um, aspects, curricula, what's the curricular offerings there, Who's the, um, tar what's that learner profile look like at the program? How are the social, emotional, behavioral supports addressing each of those pieces so that we can see what's the difference from one place to another and really looping in, I know you all are probably tired of hearing it, um, the least restrictive environment data collection tool because that really begins to talk about what are the services and supports the students Dr. need. Dr. Boyd, can you pause for a second? We don't have quorum. Sorry. I'll be no, Mesh has reminded us all, and now none of us will do it. But I, I totally could have been that person. So, yeah. I apologize. Dr. Boyd. No worries, no worries. Um, but really talking about what are those supports the students need, and again, with the discussion of looking at the least restrictive environment, really making sure we're, we're exhausting all of the supports and whatever that least restrictive environment is for a particular child. For, so for some students, it will be key center, key center or camera center. It might be public, private day. For some students, it'll be the gen ed setting. But just wanted to share that um, much of what is discussed here is reflected in the draft enhancement plan and work that's already been um, begun to be started with, you know, again, stakeholders right now because that certainly, to Mr. Henderson's point, has been an issue of concern that, um, that we're working through even now with, with school-based leaders. Thank you. Um, all right, up next we have Ms. Corbett Sanders followed by Ms. Omesh. Thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, it, it addresses many of the things that each of us have spoken to uh, you, Dr. Boyd, about over time, as well as you, Mr. Bloom. And it's wonderful to have it in one comprehensive location. I think some of the recommendations you make are excellent, but they're recommendations that um, have some budgetary impact as well. And so I do ask that we have that budgetary analysis done prior to uh, the start of the school year so that we can, if necessary, um, build that into a budget going forward. Uh, a particular has been something that this board has talked about quite a bit, which is the um, the salary levels um, for not only our um, teachers uh, that are in special education um, settings, but our um, those staff members who are providing those wraparound services, such as the PhDs, the PhTAs, you know, the whole range of them. And so I do think that's going to be really important. I also thought it was very helpful, and I had not seen this recommendation in the past, and maybe it's been here before, but um, to recommend having um, extended year contracts for the staff at our um, comprehensive sites and our extent because of the ESY piece. Um, what we have found in the past with the ESY piece is that because people are not on those year-round contracts, 
they make plans to either do something fun for the summer or they make plans to take on additional employment. And then when we go to staff ESY, we are faced with that challenge. And so I would um, be, uh, be encouraging you to set that as a priority. Then the other piece, and I don't know if I just missed it, um, but the assistive technology piece and um, how do we become much more intentional in that assistive technology piece, uh, and in particular for those um, students that may be nonverbal um, but are able to use assistive technology and then all of a sudden it's not nonverbal anymore. And, um, so I, w I would like to see a little bit more of um, maybe next year, if you all could do a deeper dive on that. Would anybody like to respond to Ms. Corbett Sanders? Okay. Um, I would point out that uh, Amanda Campbell is probably our resident person when it comes to assistive technology, particularly for communication. Sure. Uh, uh, issues and so I'll be I'll make sure to to relay your your concern onto it. The issue of year-round um, contracts uh, that is a particular uh, issue and it's been one that dates back a significant period of time within the uh, the committee. That at least as far as as long as I've been around and probably um, going back with uh, with Racha when she was with me onto it. But I think. These all lay into issues associated with retention of staff, making sure that we are effectively prioritizing those staff members, uh, that we recognize the tremendous work that those staff members are doing, and that we recognize that it is not just a uh, one-off situation. And I'll relate just one issue with assistive technology from a communication perspective. Uh, and I did this at, um, uh, I made public comment for the first time at our committee this past month, and it was because at my daughter's IEP, her teacher used assistive technology devices to allow my daughter to provide input during her IEP of the things that she appreciated, that she enjoyed, that she was engaged in. And I think getting those types of tools out there that we can do that to allow for these students to be able to participate in their own uh, IEP processes are just as critical. That's how, they, that's how they become their own advocates, and it's so important. So I would encourage that. And then you You're out of time, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'll put you down for a go back. Ms. Omesh, followed by Ms. Tolan. Uh, thank you so much for your work, Mr. Henderson and team. I know uh, how much goes into this every year. Um, I especially liked seeing some of the recommendations around IEP access, parent view, and, and other recommendations. So important. Um, I don't know how we expect families to, uh, you know, do all that needs to be done for their kids, uh, keep monitoring without understanding or being able to access their IEP. So that's definitely something I've heard from the community. Uh, but before, before I get into my more substantive points, uh, do you mind just outlining what changed? Um, between last year and where we are now in terms of responsiveness to recommendations or perhaps new, th new findings? I would say there, would be, there were two changes from last year to this year. One would be um, the air report, um, which frankly, I, I recall sitting in front of you last year and the statement saying, Boy, a lot of these recommendations that you guys made in your report showed up in, in the air, and we were like, well, yeah, that's probably surprise, because we, surprise. <laughs> we, we hear from those parents on, on those particular issues. Um, that and I believe that the focus that we were given, particularly as it relates to the, uh, the school board charge with the public day site, would be a way for us to be able to dive deeper into a lot of those particular subjects uh, which brings us back to issues of uh, educator retention, issues associated with um, uh, access to uh, these particular issues. I know it seems to be an ongoing issue with us at DSS, particularly with uh, the changes in, in IEP um, efforts, but I know that 
these are going to be ongoing issues as we, we get there. So I would, I would mention the, that as well, our particular, those particular challenges. Sure. I appreciate that because um, I was going to speak to the AIR part because I was really concerned seeing this report, specifically pages 10, 11, where the committee is reporting, you know, they were not involved in the effort, it wasn't as imagined, that their role as a key stakeholder within the steering committee of the AIR process didn't occur, that it was impeding the implementation of the report, uh, and then outlining phase two, the timeline of, of items that did not occur. Um, so I just want to gain some understanding. Like, I, I don't want to pit groups against each other here, staff and committee, but I'm really concerned as a board member. I know that was something that was a commitment of our board to make sure that the ACSD was a key sta you know, a teammate in that process. So I don't know, Dr. Boyd, maybe if you want to address that, clarify what went down, and then I'd love to hear more from whoever wants to contribute from the committee about how that was experienced. Thank you, Ms. Omesh, and, and I think we'll, if it's okay with you, I'll let Mr. Henderson speak first and I'll follow him. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's important to remember a couple of things here that when you have a 34 person committee, having one person serving on the steering committee does not amount to direct discussion with that committee for, or that direct with that group as to the steps that need to occur, how they can occur. I did serve on the steering committee. Um, I, I think the issues that are raised in this particular section of it, and you know, I don't serve on this particular subcommittee, so I want to make sure I, I highlight that to it. But I think the statement that I would say is this is far ranging issues. These, this is once in a generation attempt to look at special education and take the next best steps that are forward into it. Um, the overall uh, strategic planning efforts that took place that I was fortunate enough to be a part of, there would be the core group that would meet first, then after that you would have select um, uh, staff that was involved Following that, you would have parents and student input, and then you would literally return full circle from that aspect of things. I think as we move through these particular issues and these particular challenges, when you're talking about something that impacts some 30,000 plus students in the area, bringing together and spending more time with a group of parents, volunteers, specialists, individuals that have such range of knowledge. I think I even said this to Mr. Bloom at one point. If you were to list 50 people in Fairfax County that knew more about special education in the county, and if 10 of them weren't on, on, on that committee, I think you would probably need to re-examine the list that were involved with it. Uh, there were three of us from the committee that were on the, on the standing committee and steering committee for it, but I do believe that it is something that needed to have greater engagement and greater involvement with the ACSD um, in those particular processes. Thank you. Um, so first we want to say that we certainly appreciate the partnership of ACSD as well as um, a number of committee and organization representatives to include students um, from a number of schools that participated. Um, I think in looking at our initial vision in terms of how we um, collaborate and engage, the steering committee was intended to have representation from a number of organizations, whereby those organization representative, whether it was from, you were from ACSD, whether you were from MSAOC, FAESP, et cetera, that you would be that voice in the room to present your organization's views and perspectives um, and really highlight those priorities that are elevated within the respective organizations um, and be that conduit and serve as a um, liaison between the organization as we drafted mission, vision, values, core, core goals, and things like that. Um, and then receiving some feedback from the ACSD, um, it was shared that they wanted to be able to have some more um, opportunities for engagement as a collective body, and so that was the rationale for extending the timeline to allow for their full membership 
um, to, to engage in that process, and so we did that. And so um, I, I think that we certainly did hold to um, what we outlined in November, certainly, um, for the board. So I want to make sure we're clear about that, that we did implement what we uh, stated that we would do, um, but also that we were fluid in, in listening to that stakeholder feedback and made adjustments accordingly to ensure that there were additional engagement opportunities. I, I mean, I can understand the representation piece. I guess part of the concern is, number one is it seems transparency around who's a member, what the minutes are, et cetera, attendance records, whatever. But then also the phase two focus that lists draft mission, share draft mission, review and revise, share updated, draft implementation plan. What's alleged in this report is that none of this happened from, from last December all the way through April of this year. That, that was, I guess, meant to be share outs or something? And, and perhaps Mr. Henderson or someone from the ACSD might want to clarify because I can assure you that those items took place as outlined in the plan. And I'm happy to share any correspondence that was shared with the steering committee to, to um, solidify that. Okay. Um, Mr. Henderson? I, I will concede that there was probably communication and that there was communication that needed to be made. I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put, yeah, I'm not trying to put you in the hot seat specifically. I just want to make sure whatever staff commitments were made that, we, that we're delivering on our end to support the committee's work. So I know that's my time. I'll pick up later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Uh, Ms. Tolan followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I was very uh, happy to see the recommendations that you have in here around 2E. I have a number of constituents that have you know, children um, that are 2E, and so I've seen, and I, I just wanted to get your input. I feel like I've seen over the last several years of being on the board a lot of improvements and, and, and additional opportunities for 2E students. Do you think that is necessarily the case? In some places, yes, I would say that that's the case. But I think I would argue, and I would uh, I would also state this that I'm hearing from. I'm not a, a parent of a two E person. This is not what I would refer to a as my particular bailiwick of of uh, speciality to it. That being said, I what I hear from parents, what I hear from anecdotally, is no. Um, I don't necessarily have anything that I could specifically point to you to that end, but I would tell you that anecdotally, we hear repeatedly from our, uh, from our 2E parents that come to us and they say, no, we don't, that we, we see continued issues, we see the continued challenges, and we see those continued challenges that occur. So maybe Dr. Boyd, can you help me? I know there's some joint work with ISD and your department. Can you just Absolutely. Like moving forward what you see happening? Absolutely. So I, I certainly think that there is definitely opportunity for improvement and for growth. We, um, as you share, we've been collaborating with ISD um, on how we can support students um, who fall within that 2E um, continuum. Um, in the least restrictive environment, making sure that they're able to access the information and the material in those advanced courses and they don't have to sacrifice any services or accommodations that they would need as outlined in their IEPs and 504 plans and making sure that um, staff are equipped with the skills to support students. Um, and so that is the work that we're currently engaging in now. Again, looking across, what do those supports look like across um, settings? And we know that we there is work to be done to ensure that um, services if needed um, and that are appropriate in honors classes, AP classes, et cetera, are provided um, in accordance with students' IEP. So, so we do acknowledge that that's an area of growth and opportunity and we're working diligently on that. So it seems like some of the things that they're asking for here, like the data tracking system, would be extremely helpful for us in figuring out our programming. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, any improvement on data collection would be significant steps forward for us. Uh, I think 
we're doing a lot anecdotally right now. We need to be able to get some more solid footing to make recommendations that are coming through. And if I could just share, um, I think we talked about this in one of the parent meetings. Um, as, we, as we know, um, IEPs are just that individualized. And so some of the pieces and some of the data elements are pieces that um, we have a lot of data fields that we can pull from that are drop down boxes, form boxes, but much of the narrative that's really individualized, that's the pieces where there are those gaps. So if we want to talk about um, how many students do we currently have in FCPS who have Down syndrome? There's not a clean and efficient way for us to pull that because Down syndrome is not a disability category. Um, that would be something written in the narrative of a student's present level of academic achievement, academic achievement and functional performance. I had to slow down to get that out. Um, <laughs> see, I didn't use an acronym. I'm training myself. Um, but those are those pieces. And so um, when Mr. Henderson talks about the data requests, many of those requests are those very individualized, unique things that would be have to be pulled from that narrative element. So we certainly have data on, again, the number of students we serve by disability category, level of services, LRE, accommodations, all of those things. We have the data, we monitor that data, those type of pieces, but it's those very individualized elements. So again, there's no category for 2E, if you will. Um, and so we couldn't easily pull students who would fall into that 2E continuum, we'd have to create, an, and, and again, I'm not saying that what we have is what we have to always have, but we would have to have some additional functionality to say, this is a student who is in advanced academics and also has an IEP so that we can pull that data and then look at where those students are served along the continuum because that's some other data elements that were identified. So I just wanted to um, provide just that bit of clarification as we talk about the data um, and what we have and, and what are some opportunities moving forward. So my other comments um, kind of follows what Ms. Carver Sanders was talking about, the whole um, budget um, impact of a lot of these. And, and this is a, a, a committee report that is packed with items that have budget impact. Um, my original thought listening to the earlier conversation was, maybe to, you know, think about when staff responds, having some part of that, if we would, and I would certainly support having more of a, um, a, a certain format that we might use for each of the different committees and a section of it being what are the budget priorities. Um, but I would want to make sure that those were reviewed then again by the advisory committee because I'm not necessarily, given that how the conversation has been going this evening, not necessarily feeling like the advisory committee and staff may agree on exactly what the budget priorities are. So um, I think that might be an interesting part as we move forward, you know, because we do want to make sure that the advisory committee ideas and the expertise that are bringing to the table with the advisory committees that that is appreciated in the prioritization of, of work, whether it's with this committee or any committee. So just throwing that out. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. We'll go to Ms. McLaughlin and then I'll take my turn before it go back. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the entire ACSD. Uh, once again, you always bring us incredibly important and substantive reports and it's greatly appreciated. Um, I also want to extend my deep appreciation to my appointee, Carolyn Hayden, for the Braddock District. Um, Carolyn is not only a credibly knowledgeable parent, but Dr. Reed Carolyn used to work in our HR. Um, and so she brings with her deep experience about the challenges we face in and the vacancies we've had for special education um, teacher vacancies. And so when she and I spoke before the report, one of her deep concerns is we opened schools last year with about 150 vacancies. We're right now showing at about 300. And so she came at um, her perspective on this report is twofold. One, um, we've got to make sure that we get those vacancies filled because for every SPED teacher we don't have, it means the workload on the teachers we do have spills over because we have mandatory services. So she saw that as like our number one um, 
focused and strategic concern. Number two, um, the special education um, enhancement plan. Well intentioned, but her concerns again about overwhelming the existing and onboarding new SPED teachers. Um, she's fully supportive of the AIR, the AIR 19 recommendations, but collectively, you know, I'm always talking macro. Macro, what she said is, you've got to fill those vacancies, you've got to get the training and supports, and be mindful that we may have to go slow in order to go fast, because we cannot overwhelm and lose people. She said a recent teacher saw some of the things coming with the enhancement plan, and when we already have the comprehensive services that were under the federal you know, VRA, said, I, I can't do it. And I really worry about us losing teachers to the other school division. So two minutes went super fast, not happy. I'm going to put on record that I don't agree with how quickly we squeeze in these reports. We should have had an hour and a half. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. If, if I can, just real quick to... Yes, please. Yes, please. Carolyn Hayden is an absolutely tremendous member of our committee. Um, and I don't say that because I sit on the policy and regulation subcommittee and she is the chair of that group. Her input this year has been absolutely fantastic and uh, you should be very proud of the tremendous work that she has done uh, on your behalf on the committee. I will take my turn. Uh, I want to start by thanking David Bean, who is a local parent in Providence District. He's also a former special education teacher and a vet who has been serving us for, I think we've just put him up for another year. So very grateful for his service. <clears throat> I think if there's frustration, this is what I've been able to surmise, among the things that there might be frustration about, is that the air report validated independently much of what the community has been saying for a long time. And to see, and so, Along with validation comes the expectation, right? And then what creates maybe an apprehension is when expectations are not met. And so when we do have our conversation about the enhancement plan, one of the things I would like to zero in on is how we are aligning it with the, not just the letter of AIR's recommendations, but the intent of AIR's recommendations as well. So starting there. Second, on the issue of data, um, you know, when when the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 and was created and they had to figure out how to share data between the FBI, the CIA, every local law enforcement agency, et cetera, the biggest issue they ran into is that everybody kept their data differently, different types of data, different forms, different computers, everything. And so they had to figure out. Consequently, these same types of issues present themselves in every bureaucracy within a government or even in a business. And FCPS is not unique. I would recommend that we have some kind of a data task force, um, particularly around issues like this, where we can determine what things are even possible to clean up and make accessible. The, the dashboard efforts currently underway by the superintendent, to, it was like moving a, a small mountain to get those different pieces of information to work with each other and, and speak to each other. So there's that. And then the third piece um, is how our committee, our advisory committees function, right? We want to make it clear from charge to work to report to response to updates exactly how this should work for every committee and what's to be expected from staff, the uh, school board liaison, et cetera. Fortunately, Peck did a lot of work around that. We just have to have a work session on it and hopefully we can do that and align it with the strategic plan so that we can go forward um, and have um, some expectations, you know, that things are gonna proceed in an orderly way every year and that there's some things that will just happen because that's the way we do things. I very much appreciate everybody's work. So thank you very much. Um, we'll begin with go backs um, with Ms. Marin. Thank you. I was wondering if the superintendent could elaborate more on the work for our twice exceptional students. It's come up in different conversations and I'm just using the recommendation as a springboard to learn more about that, please. Thank you, Ms. Marin. <clears throat> um, I did just have um, my regular meeting with SEPTA this afternoon. That was one of the topics was our twice exceptional progress. And I think um, we've developed an incredible handbook, honestly, for um, twice exceptional students. I think the, the challenge right now is to take, I think we have people creating tremendous resources and they're, for some reason, they're not, um, being utilized at scale across the division in what I would call 
um, a fidelity <laughs> type of manner. I don't know. I see Noel looking at me. I'm trying to think of the right words, but I think that that right. You, if I think you go in different places in the county, and there are times people haven't didn't know we had a. 2e handbook and then there's maybe a different site that's been using it for a couple years and you know really has embraced that work so I think part of our challenge isn't that there isn't good work that's going on it's making sure that that work um, is going on in all um, on all sites and where all students who have twice exceptional needs uh, where their needs can be met so I think again that's uh, part of an organizational structure conversation uh, the board discussed our equity policy last night, and I would say our twice exceptional student needs being met are honestly an equity issue here in this division. And I think that that's um, you know, one of the tasks we're going to need to partner with our regional assistant superintendents and our chief of schools and chief equity officer and chief academic officer. I mean, this, we can't have different scripts. Uh, we all have to be uh, singing on the same um, script here. I guess it's, we don't sing off the script. Sheet music. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Um, but I, the resources are there. Um, I feel like we just uh, need to have a, a, a broader understanding, deeper understanding. And I, I think perhaps COVID interrupted some of that work. Um, but now I think we're ready with the strategic plan because I think the twice exceptional students are actually uh, very clearly a piece of this work. So um, to answer your question directly, um, we are not where we sh should be, and we're not where um, I believe ACSD expects us to be. Um, however, the work is there. So it's really now, I, sometimes you call it the knowing doing gap or the implementation gap, right? Like we need to, the implementation work is, I believe, um, the challenge at the moment. Well, thanks for the update. And I, it reminds me of what's happened with our Get to Green program where you'd have amazing resources that maybe teachers aren't aware of, and some schools use it and some schools don't. And until we make big steps like investing in the outdoor classrooms at the PD, the professional development, that's when it will happen. So I'll share that so my student who is dyslexic was just um, identified for advanced academics. So I am very interested to go through this process myself and just even trying to explain to this um, rising fifth grader what that means and trying to understand what that looks like in the classroom. And I always will put in a plug for the Made by Dyslexia campaign, which elevates dyslexia as a true asset. So um, I'm very eager to help make consistent these services that are needed to bring equity. And I'm so glad you raised that as an example. This is directly related to equity. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. So a couple things. As someone who I think was the most passionate I've ever been watching the AI report and saying we've been saying this for 20 years, it was very validating. And I think it is hard to know where to start. Um, I'm going to start with a 2E. I think we need to have a really good definition. I think this is all when we talk about data collection, the data dashboards, of what we're looking at. Right, And that definition, like 2E, it's not just academically 2E. So when we're saying we're going to collect data on 2E, what are we talking about? Right, And that's in terms of all the data we want to collect. I'm glad you mentioned you know, Down syndrome, right? But where, what do we need to collect, and then how are we going to put that in the IEP? And part of that has to be overcoming some of the barriers and mindset. Because I can't tell you during the um, steering plan how many times special education data was missing. The answer was, well, we don't do that. We don't collect that. And it wasn't we can't or we haven't, it's we don't. So I think that mindset is really important to overcome as well. Um, the C stars is really important for the ESY teams to have access to C stars earlier because they don't often, because the ESY is so short, especially shortening it by one day this year. But there's got to be checklists for IEPs, 2E handbook, transition handbook, SPED handbook. I didn't know a transition handbook existed, and neither did Ms. Bakarski. And we're on the board. Right, so these are all handbooks that exist, but they've got to be a checklist to be handed out. Can I have another go back if we have time? Let's see. We'll cross that bridge when we get to Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. Omish. I'm so happy to hear the passion around the two EPs. As the um, advocate in the community that uh, was the chair of the APAC. Um, it was the first time that ACSD and APAC worked together, and that's where the genesis of the 2E handbook came from. And we, it took four years to get the 2E handbook actually published, um, and at that time it was supposed to be put on the website so that it was prominently available 
as a resource in each for each and every school in the county because we know that um, we have two e kids at every school in the county and so I know it hasn't happened I'm begging for that to happen as well as the transition handbook which was also part of those conversations early on and I know you were one of the biggest advocates for it Ms. Eismer Heiser and so one of the things I think we have really good genesis of ideas we get the work done and then it sits and collects dust. In today's, we're all digital citizens today, so I think when we look at our um, website, we really need to reimagine how we profile these resources and push them out. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Ms. Omesh, followed by Ms. Tolan. Yeah, two final thoughts with my time. Um, one, regarding the questions that the committee asked, can someone just flesh out the process for that a little bit? Because, and specifically answering the restraint and seclusion ones, I know there were questions about where we are and what, where we are on the training part and whatnot. So can that be addressed and then just more broadly on what that process is to respond to a lot of these questions that I didn't particularly see responses to in the report? Sure, thank you, Ms. Omesh. We have a process that we put in place where after each monthly meeting, members of the ACSD who do not have an opportunity to ask a second question or if there's no time left to ask questions, uh, they would submit questions for the record. And so when we first started questions for the record last year, we were utilizing a month by month process where questions would come in. I would fan them out as the liaison to the different speakers who came to the meeting and spoke on a specific topic. We would have answers generated, get them back. And then moving into this year, well actually the end of last year, the questions started to come in uh, in a semester group of questions. So we would take September through December and then January through June and we would have questions answered. Um, we've had discussions with the executive officers because the original intent of the questions for the record were to ask questions at the monthly meeting and then if there was no time then we would follow up. And what ended up happening with a lot of the questions is, and we had talked about data requests in here quite a bit, so what ended up happening in the questions for the record is a lot of them became large data requests. So they weren't questions that you could answer in the general meeting, but we had lots of different requests now for data. And so we went through a process last year where we internally were wondering, should these uh, be FOIA requests or should we go through just our internal stakeholders to answer questions? Um, and so I'm still working with the executive officers on a, a streamlined process. I think some of the delay in getting questions answered uh, is that when I fan questions out, sometimes questions are of school-based administrators, other departments, and so I'm constantly trying to track down answers, and so we might not be as efficient in getting answers month to month. And so I really, and I at the last meeting, I really talked to the executive officers about next year really putting a process in place that's manageable, efficient, and we can get answers in a more timely manner. Because I do know the last couple of years, it, it hasn't been as efficient as it could be. So we're really looking to streamline that and, and create some more efficiencies with that process. I really appreciate that, and I've only heard accolades about you and your work with the committee, um, Mr. Bloom in particular. So. I appreciate that. And, and Christina, maybe we can add that to the list of things for reconsideration. It's inconsistent across the committees when they have data requests, questions, what happens with that. Um, this is actually more of a process than most committees have. So um, it's good to hear. Just with the remaining time, I want to harp on this translation piece. Over 25,000 translation requests for IEPs over the past year. We only have 180,000 students. 25,000 is not insignificant. If this is not going to happen, I'm going to bring a motion and I'm going to add it to new business and bring a motion at some point. I know it's down the line in AIR. Dr. Boyd, how soon is this going to happen? And if it's not happening this year, I think this is a very obvious one that has been years and years and years of recommendations. 
Thank you, Mr. Mesha. I'll pull up as we're talking because I don't want to hold up the group. Um, we are certainly looking with NC Stars to have that automated translation of IEP documents so that as we're even engaging in IEP meetings and making adjustments and things like that, our families can access the information at the same time. Um, and we're also looking at a process and our um, translation team um, is looking at a number of different pieces on how we can tr translate documents and support interpretation requests um, because sometimes there are challenges with conducting meetings at a particular time because there's the absence of an interpreter and so then families can engage. And so again, I'll pull it up um, while we're looking at this information to see where that action is drafted um, in the timeline, but the teams have been actively working on that. Um, and that is a the crux of the communication um, implementation plan to focus. So just give me a moment and I'll pull that information up for you. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Tolan and then Ms. McLaughlin. You know, most of my questions have actually been asked by others, so I'll Thank defer you. my time. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Great. Um, I would just say, Dr. Reed, that um, I, as we are going to approach the strategic plan rollout and implementation, um, having done this for so long, I really want to make sure that this report in particular does not get sort of, well, that was nice and thank you for your work, but that we really look to incorporate this um, as an action plan. And I do think because it is extensive and based on what my own appointees' concerns are, we will have to be strategic about um, taking these recommendations and, and which ones are, are going to be mission critical. Um, but I do know as one board member, um, I think sooner rather than later, it will be good for us to have um, an understanding of what we're going to do with these vacancies and um, how do we also reassure our existing special education teachers how valued they are and that we're mindful that we want to address uh, the workload concerns they're having. Um, so, and that's my time. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. All right, so I'm gonna take a quick pulse of those of us who are here. We began at 542, so we're a little bit over our one hour allotment. If anybody, um, are there any objections to allowing 30 second go-go backs to anybody who wants one? All right. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Heiser requested one first. If anybody else wants one, please put your placards up. Quick Ms. question. Sorry, sorry. Quick question. BCA BA versus BIT. I saw the recommendation for BCBAs. What about BITs? Yeah. Sorry, behavior intervention teachers yeah. versus BCBAs. Because there's more BITs than there are BCBAs, my understanding. Yeah. I was curious what the thought was on that. I'm going to have to get back to you. Okay. I understand the need for behaviors yes. assigned. I just didn't know if there's a reason for that. I need to get back to that. you. I, need to, I don't have it at the top of my head onto it. I need to go back and check through it. And I, there's also one member of the committee I know that is particularly interested in that topic. I want to make sure I'm communicating. I can, I can communicate that back through Mike or through um, Laura Jane either way. Yeah, go ahead. yeah and I'll just mention that the, uh, because of the significant behavioral challenges at some of our public day sites, the board certified behavior analysts come with a lot more training and certifications and expertise around behavior. So I think part of the thought was, uh, you know, many of the ABA coaches and the BITs are BCBAs, but mm -hmm. not all of them. Yeah. And so I think the specific request for BCBA was based on the behavioral challenges at those sites. That makes sense. I just wanted to ha get a better understanding of why one versus the other. And then, um, I just wanted to say, I wanted to lift up a couple of the things. I agree, we need to be mission critical, and, and we have the um, SPED enhancement plan on Tuesday, so this is good timing for that. But the um, translation is important, I think, and also the staffing needs are super important, because if you're not teachers, we can't teach this. Um, but I also want to lift up the PTA part for it's public day schools. That's a real need, too. So I'll stop. My time's up. Thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Corbett Sanders. Two seconds to follow up on Ms. McLaughlin. Um, when staff provides the response to this report, it would be very helpful if we could get a prioritization of what the most important budget items are in year one, year two, year three, please. Thank you. Anybody else? Ms. I just want to make sure, Dr. Boyd, yeah. I was just waiting for my turn. Uh, so in terms of the machine translation, the draft enhancement plan has that um, uh, focus for August of 2023. 
um, through November of 2023. Um, and again, the team has been working on that through this year and leveraging Google Translate with our um, IEP online software provider. Um, in terms of um, additional interpreters, um, that is later. And again, I can follow up and I don't want to belabor the moment too much, um, but I look very quickly for that immediate IEP translation piece that I think is going to be mission critical um, for our families with IEPs and both 504. So I just want to make sure I elevate that as well. So you're saying by November 2023, families should expect that they will have interpreted or translated IEPs? That is our target date for having the machine translation of our in our IEP system and our C-STARS for IEPs and 504s. So families should be able to access translated IEPs by that point? That is our goal. Okay, and if it's just going to be machine translation, like what are our quality assurance uh, commitments? And, and all That's a big the, deal with yeah. like, I have never seen anything auto translated that made any sense in Arabic or Spanish. Absolutely, all of those pieces. And again, we have a subcommittee that's working on that. So I'm happy to connect our, our um, co-lead, Leah Skirpsky, with you so to get some additional details because she's been leading that work. Yeah. Okay, because it's a technical, it, it, we're not just oh, talking absolutely. about like plain old conversation. Oh, absolutely, old, right? and that's why this process has been, they've been working on this for probably the last half of this year. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that November 2023. Yes, All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Marin. Yeah, I have to follow on, um, especially I've mentioned this book before, Voices from Around the IEP Table, which really goes through some of the experiences of the different folks that are in the room, and especially parents. and you know, a computerized translation, just I don't think that's what we're aiming for. We need a, someone to be able to speak the language, the body language in the room and translate with that specific type of language. So, yeah, I just, I, I can't agree more with what Ms. Omesh is saying. And just to clarify, so we're talking about a difference when I'm talking about translation, I'm talking about the written documents. When we're talking about the discussion, I will refer to interpreters. Those are two different pieces. The information that I just shared with Ms. Um, Omesh was specific to translation of the written document. The interpreters, that's also included in here that actual supports the meeting. And that's when I said I can follow up and talk to you a little bit more about as we flesh through, because all of that is outlined in the communication plan. I just want to be respectful of the hour. Okay, but I will quickly add that even even the IEP is so technical. I mean, I, I shared with you my own son's IEP to say, look at these, there's confusion here. And there, so there's just even that basic sense of we need to get out of the ed speak and speak to parents who are not experts in special education. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Merritt. And I will make one final point. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Bloom mentioned the possibility of FOIAs for data and this is one of the reasons why we have to hammer out this process because we should, you know, that could require money and we shouldn't be charging our advisory committees for access to the data to work on the issues that we've agreed to let them work on. Um, so I will leave it at that. I very much appreciate staff uh, and our advisory committee members for being here um, and for the open discussion. So we're going to take a five minute, go ahead. And I just um, want to, again, on behalf of um, DSS, just thank Mr. Henderson for his time. Um, I know he's dedicated a lot of time away from family and, and friends, and um, I know we ask a lot of him. So just want to take this moment to publicly thank him for his commitment and his service to FCPS. And since there are only seven of us, we're going to take a five-minute recess before coming back for our uh, TPAC. Go ahead and start with TPAC and the dream team of TPAC. I'm a little biased. I had the honor and the pleasure of working closely with you all this year. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, I truly believe, um, first off, TPAC, like ACSD, is a mandated advisory committee. And so the work that you all do is so important, and we need to have that very intentional um, feedback from you all. Uh, I think that 
TBAC is a bit unusual in its structure. So, Mike, I hope when um, you introduce the report tonight, you will also give a little bit about your innovative approach to the advisory committee because there is no other committee structured like you all do. Okay. Um, and with that, what I would like to do is start by introducing uh, the Dream Team. Courtney, aren't you going to be up there? There's space. And I would start with the, the chair of the TPAC and, uh, is M Mr. Mike Waltz. He has been the chair now for four years? I think it's four. Four, I think Seems so like too. 20, but four. You know, <laughs> that's because you have mastered it so well. And we have Maria Worthen from the NAACP, as well as um, this year's uh, very brand new um, director of Title I, uh, but somebody who uh, knows the issues of Title I schools extremely well because she uh, was an excellent uh, principal leader of one of them, and that is Amy Miller. And we have, as well, um, Courtney White, who is the coordinator of grants and um, for Title I. Noelle, are you getting up there, too, or no? <clears throat> well, you're listed on my list, so you, there is a seat up there if you would like to join us. And Noelle Clemenko needs no introduction, but she is our assistant superintendent for instruction. And with that, Mike, if you could do, do a brief overview of what you all have been doing. And then, once again, your innovation of believing that this work is so important and why your charge is structured the way it is. Thank, Thank you. you for that. And even though you have mentioned them, I still want to say it again and give some acknowledgement. <clears throat> see her on the, on the screen, Ms. Keys Gamara, who was our rep the previous school year. Just want to acknowledge and thank her for her support. I want to also thank Ms. Corbett Sanders for her support this year as we came back to in-person meetings. And Noel, this was our first year working together. And you know, huge thank you to the Title I team with Amy, Courtney, and Tim Paper, who's not here, but who have supported us in and out before meetings, during meetings, after meetings, to help us you know, do the work that we do. And we wouldn't be able to do it without them. So appreciate that very much. If you could go to, I think, the third or fourth slide. The first few slides are more, they're introductory and they're more refer for your reference and background. We really want to get into the content of what we've been working on, what we want to talk about. One more slide up, please. So as Ms. Corbett Sanders said, the TPAC is, it's really <clears throat> a component of requirement of the Elementary and Secondary School Act to provide an opportunity for input and consultation with parents and teachers. And as you see those four bullets, it, it's an overview, but it's not everything that we've done, everything that we do. And I'll say that we are working on strengthening how each of those things are happening. But what it has provided is an opportunity for parents at schools to step into leadership and learn more about what goes in the county and start to cultivate a relationship with their principals. And just so you know the flow of it, Marie and I will take turns and go back and forth as we discuss the topics tonight. So I'm gonna walk through the, actually if you could go back to the fifth slide. Thank you. Um, so I want to walk through the roles and functions of our TPAC members who um, come from uh, every Title I school in the division um, and uh, also includes not only parents but teachers, principals, um, and anyone else who wants to attend can come. Um, and it's really, it's more than an advisory committee. It's really a learning, um, it's a learning collaboration, I think, for both us as parents as well as for staff. Um, and we have spent this year learning together um, about Title I, about each other's experiences, and about the science of reading and how it's rolling out in our schools. 
Um, and so uh, the first two bullets here are, are some things that worked really well, I think, for us. Um, we spent some time, we devoted an entire meeting to learning about Title I and what it looks like specifically in Fairfax County. We got an excellent overview of that from Courtney White. And I have to say, even as someone who has myself a pretty deep understanding of the federal policy on Title I, um, I learned a lot of new information because it, it's truly unique um, in Fairfax, the way it looks and the way the funding rolls down through the state and district. So I think having that level setting for all of us was very eye-opening um, and laid a good foundation for people to be able to approach our work together. Um, in terms of being able to provide feedback, ask questions, and express ideas to further enhance family and school partnerships, that was at the core of our meeting design this year. Um, I think, you know, during the pandemic, it was challenging to have that two-way communication. Um, it was more of a webinar format, but this year we were back in a hybrid format, and um, our meetings were designed very intentionally to allow for learning, um, but also reflection and um, exchanging information. And so as parents, we learned a lot from each other. We were able to kind of compare notes. Like this has been my experience with, I have a first grader at Beach Tree Elementary. We've had overall a pretty great experience with um, with the school. Um, and and then, you know, maybe having a parent at the same, the same table saying, well, that hasn't been my experience and kind of understanding the variability that can happen across the county, I think to Dr. Reed's point during the prior report that we have a lot of great resources and information and task forces and things here in Fairfax County, but it doesn't always get rolled out in the same way at every school. And so um, I think just sort of as a source of uh, qualitative data, TPAC is truly a gold mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's one reason why I think you should really listen to us and take our report seriously <laughs> because we really do represent that full sort of breadth of experience of what it is like to be a parent of a child in these schools, um, both the triumphs and the struggles. Um, in terms of being able to offer stakeholder input um, to inform central Title I action spending and guidance for Title I schools, I just want to acknowledge the wonderful Title I staff. Um, this has been really, truly a joyous collaboration for me personally, and I know a lot of the parents on the committee feeling like we are really heard, and not just that we're heard, but that they are learning from us um, and in, in a really authentic way. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet with Superintendent Reed, and we really appreciate that she took the time to come to one of our meetings, answer questions, and listen and learn with us. Um, but that said, it is unclear, and I think Mike will speak to this later, um, the extent to which our recommendations are heard outside of that sphere. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, a really um, important role for our representatives is to bring the information that we're learning back to the schools um, and to develop a partnership and collaboration with our school teams and our principals. And I will say that this is one area where we, you know, we talked a lot about this. We heard from some good examples, but we need a lot of help. And again, um, one of our recommendations, recommendation four, is going to speak to this a little bit more about the help that we as parents really need to um, form more uh, meaningful partnerships and communication with our principals. You know, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so a little bit of a history lesson how we got here. So two years ago, we had issued a report, and the previous school year, we had had meetings and discussions. And when it came time to, I guess, report season, had not heard anything back on the recommendations or anything in the report. And, you know, it was, I think this was Dr. Reed's first three weeks or so. She met with boards of school board committees, chairs of school board committees. And I said, you know, I chair the TPAC. And a few others were like, we do this so-and-so. We submit a report in the spring, some more in the spring. I said, we're not submitting a report this year. We did a letter reaffirming what we said the previous year, and from that, and it was frustration, to be honest, because we had worked very hard, and we are representing 
and I'm not saying necessarily us, but we are representative of a group of parents who are from the schools that are most vulnerable in the county. And the time and effort people put into and give is precious. And if we feel that's squandered, you know, that's not respectful to what to them, their experiences, their life. So we didn't submit one. And but from that came an opportunity because Dr. Reed, we met over the summer, we kind of talked about it and a subsequent meeting with Chair Sizemore Heiser and kind of came to this charge and really focused on the science of reading as it's being rolled out and thought it would be not only something that falls under kind of the jurisdiction of what the TPACs Title I supposed to look at, but who is against their kids reading? It's, <laughs> we fight about a lot of things. <clears throat> I haven't heard anybody say, no, I don't want my kids to know how to read. So that's how we got this charge. And, you know, it's important to know that, you know, no matter what an idea is, how positive, how impactful it could be, implementation is everything. And tracking that, measuring it, refining it, that's, you know, why I think it's such an appropriate one for this group. And over the course of the year, we had such interest from everybody who attended, both folks who presented and parents, community members who were there. I'm just really glad we came to that, to that point. Yeah. Yeah. And just, I think a little more background on why this issue feels so important, um, you know, other than the fact that we all need our kids to learn to read to be successful, that's really the bedrock of, <laughs> of the learning journey, um, is that we have known um, as a country um, what the science is behind how children need to be taught to learn to read. For over two decades, you know, you look back, the National Reading Panel convened in, I think, 1999 and came out with its recommendations. We had a national um, program, Reading First, that put billions of dollars into disseminating the science of reading across the country um, under No Child Left Behind, which unfortunately became politicized as part of the sort of overall uh, backlash to No Child Left Behind. Um, and I think this is one situation where the baby really got thrown out with the back, the bath water. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, you know, I, um, as the liaison, community liaison from the Fairfax County chapter of the NAACP, I also wanna shout out to my <laughs> colleagues on the education committee there who um, worked really hard and partnered with many any of you um, to ultimately convince you to um, take this issue, the issue of, of uh, science of reading on morning meaningfully. Um, and so even though it feels like a no-brainer, these are battles that have been fought over and over again over several decades. And um, so we, as we go through our recommendations, um, we also you know, think about how important the communication is about what we're doing and why we're doing it so that we don't <clears throat> backtrack ever again and so that our kids um, who are most struggling will be able to learn to read. And if I can do a time check, um, if we can kind of spend another 10 minutes on your report and then we're gonna go to question and answer. Um, so uh, if we can go to the next slide, I'm just going to go through this very quickly, being mindful of the time. Um, so this is just kind of our syllabus for the year. These were the topics we covered during our meetings. Um, we had the opportunity to meet with various staff and advisors from the division um, and really learn together and compare notes as parents and um, other school team um, members about how things were working or not working at our respective schools. So at, at this point, I'll hand it over to Mike to um, introduce the recommendations. I'm going to go through the recommendations and not repeat what's written, but just kind of explain a little bit behind it. So recommendation one is really about the communication of this. And we recognize that it wasn't, you know, as if September 10th, every school had a certain thing. Every, every school had the same materials, the same amount of time. But it's really helpful for parents to get a sneak peek of what's coming. And it could be discussed, it could be sent in an email, it could be discussed at back to school night. I think it should be an and, not an or. I read too many emails about national merit stuff. We can share good news, and we should share good news, and tell folks this is coming, so parents know if they see, whenever they see the materials, they have a little bit of background, a point of reference, 
and they can have a better dialogue with their kids, with their teachers. But I think at the same token, the message needs to be communicated effectively to staff as well. Whatever it is that they need to know, they need to be comfortable with it. So if they're asked about it, they know what to say, they know how much they can say, and they know what level they are of implementation their respective school. But that's something that we need to be much more proactive in doing, talking about and communicating about this is coming. Some history of why it's being done, because that always helps to explain, you know, why are we doing this, what was wrong before, and the path forward. So the next recommendation um, is around professional learning um, for teachers to be able to um, teach to the science of reading with fidelity um, requires a lot of training, a lot of job embedded ongoing mm -hmm. professional development and coaching. Um, and so this is an area where um, that's just a really worthy investment of, um, of time. Um, and ensuring that, that teachers do have the time to learn this, to get feedback on their practice um, in a really constructive way and that they're not being you know, evaluated on, on that right out the gate before everyone's had the opportunity to, um, to really get that information. Um, it, it's, um, I know, you know at, at my son's school at Beach Tree, you know, um, the, his first grade teachers got the Orton-Gillingham training just a few weeks ago, um, but I think it's a you know several days. They were out for a week. It requires sub coverage, so this is a not insignificant amount of time. And I think also just to kind of follow up on that, getting the feedback from the the literacy leaders in their schools. Um, you know, it takes time. It takes personnel, um, and this is something that should be prioritized. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to recommendation number three uh, around response to intervention. Um, I'm not sure if it would be helpful for me to give a quick explanation of response to intervention. I don't wanna assume that you don't know. <laughs> I don't wanna assume that you do. Um, so essentially response to intervention is a multi-tiered system of support that um, is used to ensure that students are um, learning to read in sort of their proximal um, zone of development. Is that the right term? Um, the, that they are getting the help they need, they are learning, um, that they are learning. And so um, tier one is sort of the whole group instruction, the instruction that everyone's getting, um, and then evaluating with assessments um, how are students doing. If that's not quite meeting their needs, tier two is more differentiation in smaller <clears throat> groups. If that's not working, tier three is more intensive interventions, could be one-on-one -on -one or very small groups. Um, and response to intervention um, also helps us ensure that we aren't over identifying students for special education and that we're kind of running through every, that we're really throwing everything we have at, uh, instructionally at students um, before we um, uh, sort of evaluate them for uh, learning difficulty. Um, but as a parent who has been going, trying, fighting to get my son evaluated <laughs> for four years now, we finally, we did finally just get him um, eligible at the end of his first grade year um, based on dyslexia. Um, so he'll finally be getting services in second grade. Um, and it's too bad it couldn't have started earlier. But, um, <laughs> But the, um, even as someone who has professionally worked on response to intervention in science of reading and special education, I found the process very confusing. Yeah. And I, I think that um, not just me, you know, many other parents on our committee, you know, whether their kid was behind or ahead, going to their school and saying, what can you do for my child to meet them where they are? What, and um, some schools just were excellent in their response and others were saying, well, we're already going above and beyond for your kid. Well, you know, what more do you want from us kind of? So it's, so this, the recommendation says response to intervention, but really the recommendation is overall, what is the communication around where students are in learning to read and how is the school communicating about what are they doing to ensure that they are getting to where they need to be on grade level <laughs> and what is the communication around that special education evaluation process. Mm -hmm. So, um... The next recommendation is kind of a resurrection of a previous one. <clears throat> and it came about really from the committee members themselves 
talking about challenges they have in building relationships with their principal and debriefing them because ideally after a meeting there'd be some sort of debrief whether an email whether a phone call whether a sit down and a lot of it wasn't happening and in fairness principles that we had in 2019 look very different from the principles we have now and some of them started on a computer screen and they're just they just met kids for the first time probably in the fall of 2021 and they have a lot they had to have to manage and TPAC could be what's that yeah. may not have an idea what it is and don't don't realize how valuable it can be as an asset and a resource yeah. and a place they can get guidance and community and strength from so we're bringing this back and encouraging that principals administrators or vice principals attend at least one a year and the reason why that's important it's not just for principals knowledge but folks get nominated to get put onto this committee by principal nomination and if you don't know what this committee does how credible is your not informed is your nomination or recommendation going to be if you ask a parent to do something and you don't really know how to explain what it is they're doing you're not really going to get the turnout you're looking for and when we last made that recommendation and what really helped was that title one would meet with principals and stress to them the importance of and just inform them about the TPAC our attendance at meetings shot up and it stayed strong and the pandemic obviously impacted all of that but we think we had a good year like rebuilding if you will this will only help in those efforts especially as we as we undertake this discharge about science of reading Last recommendation, which is really the most important. So let's see. So in 2020, our kids were sent home. Everybody was sent home. And because we had a global pandemic where people lost lives, lost loved ones, were gravely ill. They were at home. People had a more attentive viewing audience, if you will. There was a more attentive viewing audience Folks saw citizens get murdered by the police, long extended videos. They saw people storm the Capitol to subvert an election. They saw the worst examples of human behavior. And they also were separated from friends. They spent more time on these electronic things that we carried around that buzz all the time. That was basically their teacher, their babysitter, their everything for a good stretch of time. And then we walked back in in 2021 and we're just back to school. And everything's back to normal and it will never be normal again none of us will ever be normal again we are all living in crisis we are doing the best we can but that's the situation we're in so when you hear and when i hear about oh it's crazy there's fighting the kids don't know how to act they don't know how to behave my son was in fourth grade when it started he was in middle school when he came out my other son was in middle school when it started he was in high school when it came out if we do not recognize the impact that these kids have been subjected to, the impact of what's gone on, none of this will matter. If we don't look after staff who've been through the same trauma that students, they're not gonna be able to learn what they need to learn, to deliver, to instruct. Administrators, all of us, we don't have a sense of community right now because everybody is hurting, everybody is on edge, and no amount of learning, no amount of great ideas will make its way in if we're not available. We must have a systematic and ongoing trauma-informed response and resource support system for this school community as a whole, staff, students, families. We don't talk about it enough. Everybody walks around and it's like we don't see it we really need to acknowledge it and give space for it and we need to work at it. Otherwise, all the great ideas won't matter. All the kids we want to teach to read won't learn. All the staff, if they stay, won't be able to teach as effectively. We really want to make that point that we have to do something different. We have to acknowledge where we are. We will never be where we were. And in order to move forward with clarity, we have to do something different. Being that this is a new paradigm of instruction, 
our charge for next year and I would say subsequent years, but at least for next year, we're gonna continue oversight running parallel with the equitable access to literacy plan because it is so new and there's gonna be bumps along the way and there's gonna be refinements needed and there's gonna be instructional curriculum materials that we wanna have a role in reviewing and, cons and being consulted on because our group gave us so much information this year about the things that were working well and what wasn't working well and we need to continue to be part of that process so that's the charge that we put forward, and it's something that it's only fair and reasonable for the county itself to give itself time and for us to do the same by walking, you know, hand in hand and giving it time to really take root. We know right now it's mainly being done at the elementary school level, but what about kids in middle school and high school who really don't read or can't read? There are kids who can't read in high school. They're there. What do we do about them? So that's the charge we want to have for, that we're proposing for next year. And I would be remiss if I don't acknowledge real-time events happening. Last night you all had a thorough work session about the equity policy. And I've been on a committee that was developing that. And two years ago I said, different framework but same topic that dealing with this issue of reckoning with our history and where it has brought us now was going to be one of the seminal events of your tenure. And now you have an equity policy to decide on. Implementation will be the challenge. Voting for it is easy. Vote for it. We need you to support it. Done. Now you all know why it's so much fun to go to a TPAC meeting. <laughs> Truly really is an inspiring committee, and really, um, because of your your approach, I've seen when you wanted to first be all uh, virtual. I think having this hybrid is getting people really excited and wanting to be part of the process, and increasing the comfort zone of principals to have people involved, so thank you. I do have um, three board members who have, actually four board members who have indicated they would like to speak. Um, and I'm gonna start with Mr. Frisch, followed by Ms. Marin. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation and all the work that went into it. Dive right in on recommendation four, that seems like a pretty easy ask. Dr. Reed, do you think we can require our principals to attend and our assistant principals? Well, we can do a lot of things. What <laughs> I would want to do is make sure we go back and have that conversation at the senior leadership level. But it, I certainly think that the recommendation, there's a reason for it. And um, it also is perhaps the principals aren't aware of how important this is and the topic that's being discussed. So um, I will address it. Thank you. Um, the one I want to zero in on the recommendation wise is number three because that's what I hear most frequently from parents um, is the, the difficulty in accessing services. Um, as I was listening to the presentation, some things that came into my head were how are we going to help, how do we better help parents understand how to navigate the different tiers and get the supports that they need for their kids? Because one of the things I've heard many times now in the last year is that <clears throat> when looking at the iReady assessments, parents are seeing something different than the educators are seeing. And so how are parents to make sense of the services they're getting from their educators if the recommended fixes or helps are not matching up? Any thoughts on, on how we can be doing this better? So, um, and I might need staff to weigh in on this, but um, the one thing I'll say is assessment really helps. And there was some, there were some new um, reading assessments that were rolled out this year, I believe, that really give more granular information about student reading um, than the iReady. And I'll say just in my, again, in my own case, I, I it, my son, I think one of the reasons that he was not identified earlier was because the iReady was okay, 
you know, it was kind of like on the low end, but he was still within. But then when they went into some of the other assessments, he was very, very low. Um, and so having those, I'm really grateful that those new assessments were added because it allowed us to really hone in on where he was struggling. Um, so I think, um, and you know, I, I wanna acknowledge here how much pressure the special education teams are under, how much pressure principals and assistant principals and teachers and everyone else is, is under, and there are so many different processes related to getting those students evaluated. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of lingo, you know, we're sent these very thick informational packets and told, well, you already have the information, but um, I couldn't, I honestly couldn't find anything written anywhere about what happens before you get to local screening. I, I, there's nothing. Um, I've combed through the website, I've combed through the hub. <laughs> Um, I, I can't find anything. So I think just uh, to start, it would be good to have some basic information about what is RTI and um, for parents and what is it, you know, if you have, you or a teacher has a concern about your, your child learning to read, this is what should be happening. And I, you know, one thing we talked a lot about and in terms of engaging with our schools is like just knowing what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of helped coach each other on that. You know, I'm having this, I, I don't know what to ask my principal. I don't know what to ask my child's teacher. So just kind of understanding what questions to ask to start those conversations. I don't think anyone's willfully holding back that information. Parents just don't necessarily know what questions to ask. Well, and along those lines, you know, um, I imagine the work around implementing our science of reading program is a bit like drinking out of a fire hose and then being like, I need more water, right? Like it's just, there's a lot to do and there's going to be a lot until it's, you know, increasingly a lot more. Um, I wonder if there's not room for instructional services to work with uh, OCCR, you know, people have their expertise, right? OCCR's expertise is marketing, uh, engagement, communications design, maybe they can assist in you know, helping to create materials and web resources, videos, et cetera, in conjunction with TPAC that help explain these critical uh, opportunities for parents and their kids. That is definitely on our roadmap. Um, we've actually been meeting with some organizations who um, have federal grants to kind of help with that, you know, to try and uh, leverage some free resources that will help parents not only understand the why, but also to help their child at home. So we have some things um, for overall general communication and support. I also wanted to just note that as part of the Virginia Literacy Act, one component that was um, goes into implementation in school year 24-25 are reading plans. So I think this is gonna be incredibly helpful to parents as um, the students who are um, struggling with reading will have a plan that's developed individually for them with parent input that not only um, states the data, but states the plan and what are the progress monitoring. So we have lots more to unfold as the state kind of um, reveals that template that we'll be giving the board updates as that becomes apparent. So I think that's gonna be a real game changer for parents sort of understanding where their child is and what's being done to help them uh, when it comes to reading. Thank you, and speaking of the state, do we have approved materials? <laughs> yes, we do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Basil Resource um, wow. <laughs> Committee starts the summer. Oh my goodness, yes, big we news. Do. <laughs> Couldn't come a, a year too soon. Um, I very much appreciate everybody's work and participation in today's meeting very much. Thank you. Thank you, and before uh, Ms. Marin goes, I do want to inform the people in the audience that we are running about 45 minutes late and uh, because we have just enough for quorum, so we're going to go uh, we will be starting the next agenda item between 8.10 and 8.15. We'll let you know closer to the time. Miss um, Marin? So I'm thinking about a lot of different connections that um, you, you might not be privy to, including yesterday we went, it was public, but the governance work that we're seeking to do. We talked about advisory committees. We talked about it even in this, the previous report tonight, you know, I'm bringing to this 
to your to listening to your session, you know, my own experience being on MSAOC in the early 2000s, being on HRAC in 2017, frustrations about serving on an advisory committee and honoring the commitment of people, and um, I respect the way that you've navigated that. You know, something I've asked the board to do is to figure out how we can update one another more about each of our committees. I think that could be a start. You know, I've asked, could we have these at our regular meetings? Everyone share, what is your committee up to? And so that's something that I'd like to revisit, and I see that as an opportunity for us. The other thing that, so I'm looking at our school board webpage about TPAC, and so in Hunter Mill, I used to have three Title I schools. Then the threshold got increased, and now we have one. Although I know the need is still greatly there. And we just keep getting squeezed and squeezed to spend our Title I dollars. So I counted 31 schools listed. It said we used to have 42. But just because I only have one Title I school, and even if I had none, I think I should have a representative on your committee. Because it's not only an issue in part of the school division, it's an issue that I want to be responsible for. So I think the board, too, should reconsider the makeup of the committee in that, yes, we have representatives from each um, Title I school, but also, why not have a representative of the board on each uh, of each board member, just like we do, I think, on every other committee. I think this is the only one where there's not. Um, so that's something, and I didn't do an analysis right here, but you know, and just thinking about equity and understanding the needs. Um, and Ms. Miller, it's nice to see you since I last saw you over at Kilmer Middle School. But I'm I'm also wondering, you know, what is the update on Title I? We know, federal, and, you know, that's where I started my career in the Title I office, U.S. Department of Ed. What's happening? The funding you know, reauthorization. I think those are kinds of things, again, that the full board should know about on a regular cadence. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, there's probably nobody better to update us on what this current status of uh, Title I is than uh, Ms. Miller um, as the director of those programs. And if you wanted to give a brief update, then I'm going to go. Uh, and your other recommendations, I think, are subject to a more robust board discussion, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, in fact, we will have to check the, the website because it should actually have 44 schools on there. We are um, ex uh, expanding Title I by two schools for next year. We are welcoming Mason Creston and Glasgow Middle School. Um, so, you know, we went through a process with leadership team to look at the, um, the level of uh, poverty rate in um, uh, across the county and identify our thresholds. There is one um, component that has shifted over the years, and that is how we determine um, a Title I status. So previously, we always used free and reduced meal forms, which were collected at the school level. And um, now it is a requirement that we use community eligibility program data. And so, um, you know, there's conversations and that shifts, you know, how we're looking at those needs within schools. So, you know, when I look at where we are, um, we're taking on two additional schools next year. So now we'll have two middle schools, one more elementary school, and every year we'll be looking at where we are as a county and where we can expand based on the budget that we're given. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Seismer-Heiser. Great, thank you. Um, first, I want to say um, I'm very sorry um, that your son had to wait that long to get services. Uh, it was one of the reasons when I first ran for the board in 2011 that I heard from our families um, identification um, unless families knew what to ask um, my own son I did not get tested till he was a junior in high school um, and and even then we had to get outside private testing um, to identify because he was doing well in school and so everybody said well then he's fine but he knew he wasn't fine and um, he learned to just cope so um, I'm, I'm glad you're getting the services you need. And Dr. Reed, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're getting better at it. Um, secondly, um, I want to say that uh, number five, when I think about trauma-informed care and um, 
This is one of the reasons why I've been a champion of community schools, because wraparound services are essential. Our classroom teachers can't do it alone. Our school social workers and psychologists are stretched thin, um, a lot of them doing IEP and 504s. And so um, I believe we can help our Title I schools in that community schools model. Um, and that's, that's bringing county services um, in and um, wrapping around and helping our families and our students. Nothing is more crucial than how do we help support parents to know what to ask for and you can't know what you don't know. And um, in my last 26 seconds, I will say that I absolutely agree about the uh, pending equity policy vote. The vote is easy, the implementation is hard. And as I shared the, uh, just last night, <coughs> It was in 2017 that we passed the one fair facts policy, a race and social equity policy. So for five and a half years, the school division along with the county government and the board of supervisors were committed to equity work. So we need to recommit ourselves and we need to know what that's gonna mean. Words are words, actions are a whole nother thing. So if there's time for a go back, great. But thank you again for your investment of time with this. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. I'll put you on a go back. Ms. Eismer Heiser. Thank you, and thank you for your time and energy and effort. And as uh, two students who, as a parent of two students, one with an IEP and one with a 504, I can say my son, who has more significant needs, getting him identified was not difficult. But my daughter, it took several years and also private testing. So I'm sorry it took so long, but I understand that it can take a long time for some students. And, and we have gotten better, but we need to keep doing more. Um, as for trauma-informed, I really appreciate it. First, thank you for the meeting last summer, and I really appreciate you lifting that. Um, Ms. Pekarski and I actually, and she is ill today, but we actually brought a, a forum topic that this board heard in June 2022 to have a systematic policy and approach to trauma-informed practices. And it was referred to a work session. And then when, this was just before you started, Dr. Reed, but when you started with the strategic plan, I think it was part of finishing that work and then looking at those pieces of it. But we actually, it was all about, and we, there was a lot of research we linked to it, about COVID and the rise of anxiety and the, imp and the need for a systematic approach to trauma-informed um, because of what we recognize. I've said for a long time that COVID was a global trauma and we all have global PTSD. And I've been saying that, I think, for two years. And many of my board members, my colleagues have heard me say that, but that was something that this board, I, I really appreciate, supported having that trauma-informed approach. We do have a trauma-informed specialist, I believe. So I think this is really timely for you to lift that up. Um, the other piece I wanted just to lift up is the theme between ACSD, which we just heard in here, was that parent engagement, parent knowledge process, and translation um, came up as well of the IEP documents. And so I wanted to really lift up what you said. Um, I mentioned in the previous one about we have all these handbooks that parents don't know about, right? And we have a special education handbook, and but when you read about the referral process in there, it's not really that clear, right? And when you Google special education, it really links to the handbook and has a list of definitions. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement and kind of writing to for the perspective taking of someone who's new to this process. And I talk about perspective taking a lot, and I think that's a really important point. I know I'm out of time, so hopefully it's time for a go back, but I really appreciate these points you've lifted up. They're super important. Any response? Sure. I want to stress that crisis didn't start in 2020. We were in crisis long before the pandemic. It just stripped it bare. It made it more clear. And maybe some people who weren't in were in and then started to look at others, maybe appreciate what was happening. So I, I want to underscore that. We, it didn't just start. It's just been, you have more economic instability, housing instability, mental health trauma, and I'm glad that you all are, are, are taking it up. And it's, I mean, it has to happen from top to bottom level. I mean, when I think about it and I, and I hear how, you know, I had discussion with my kid, one of my kid's teachers, you know, he know how to act. It's like, you realize it was in fourth grade last time he had to sit down in a classroom. Things that we think are so mundane that we all take for granted, you know, we complained to our kids about how we had to walk and whatever to school when we were growing up. And, you know, we didn't have a pandemic that kept us home for a year and a half. Like, what would we have done? Because we didn't have technology then. How would we have done school if we had to be at home? So. And if I could just add to that, I mean, we have to connect the dots here. Um, it, 
you know, the, the crisis we're having with drug abuse. That's self, some of that is self-medication. Some of that is, you know, I mean, we have to connect the dots here. And I think there's just this running theme that we heard with the ASCD report and this. We have a lot of great resources and committees and specialists in FCPS. The question is, is it getting to the kids? Um, and, and I think that's where, um, that's the challenge, right? Words, the words are great, but how is the implementation happening? Um, and we have, with the trauma, we have to connect the dots between all of these challenges we're seeing and, and acknowledging, not just acknowledging, but also addressing the role that trauma plays. Thank you. Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Omish. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate um, everything that you've been doing, and I really appreciate the um, your statement at the end where you're going to continue to work on this um, into the next year. Because as you pointed out very wisely, you know, implementing the science of reading is going to take years. And, you know, we've kind of started in the lower grades and we're trying to move up and we're trying to deal with high school, you know, situations like you're talking about. Um, so I think that's, a, you know, I really appreciate that you're willing to, you know, continue with that charge. Um, I also really appreciated your comments on, on trauma. We've, uh, several other members have brought that up as well, but I think it's real, you know, we've been talking about it and it's something we really need to stay focused on and, um, you know, working with our kids and our staff, as you pointed out. Um, I do want to mention, um, I uh, represent Drainsville, and so we've got some pretty amazing work going on um, at Hutchison and Clearview that I've been able to um, observe firsthand. Um, Dr. Reed and I were both at Hutchison, and I've been going in and just asking about, you know, what's happening with the science of reading. And, um, you know, they've been doing some very uh, forward-thinking and innovative work using, you know, coaches and reading specialists to co-teach and really co-learn with um, teachers and, you know, move this forward. So if, you know, when you, as you talked earlier, if we're looking for a bright, great story to tell, um, you know, there's some great things going on in those schools in particular. Um, but they also kind of do their own work around community schools. Um, Ms. McLaughlin brought up, um, you know, that whole framework, how bringing in these community resources and how important that is um, for the schools to be successful. So, you know, figuring out how we can possibly help these schools, you know, bring in those resources as well, um, you know, will be really helpful. But um, just helping those schools to communicate what they're doing, the good news, and communicating among the schools on what's working and what's not working and, and moving this forward um, as efficiently as possible. Um, it would be fabulous to have your you know, help on that. And that's the benefit of having administrators at our meetings because principals can, I think understandably so, be very locked into their planet and not realize there's a whole solar system and universe outside and just because something is happening here, they believe it's happening elsewhere and they're kind of shocked to find it isn't. So they really, it, it helps them see the bigger part, the, the broader solar system, if you will, and how they're related to other planets, if you will. And I only learned that because I heard years ago one principal was like, well, every student has access to advanced learning, right? No, <laughs> and when I think it was when I presented to the board that year, and Dr. Brabrand's like, mm, I don't think everybody really has it, and it helps them realize maybe how not just how fortunate they are, but what's going on in other places. And I don't know if principals come to, together to advocate for certain things, but if they get a sense of what's not going well, and maybe it, it's at their feeder schools. If you're a high school, what's happening at the middle school, elementary school level? You have a greater awareness. You can advocate for it because you know we represent mainly elementary schools, but they don't finish. They don't go out into the world after fifth or sixth grade. You know, it's a journey throughout, and folks need to have a better sense of the beginning to the end. Thank you. Thanks for your work, Sumesh. Yeah, thank you to the committee. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of this work, and uh, I was excited to serve before, and, and just I'm pleased to see the recommendations here, because they couldn't be overstated. Um, I did want to, 
you know, offer an opportunity. I know that this is technically a school board committee, but Dr. Reed, there's huge opportunity here as we continue outlining how we implement the strategic plan, um, specifically with those family engagement pillars to leverage TPAC. I think connecting them more um, officially with the Family Engagement uh, Partnerships Office and having some of that work go through the, the TPAC, I think is a great opportunity. And then the second piece is with the literacy plan, uh, since they are reviewing it and there's a lot of buy-in on their end and understanding the details of it, I, I think TPAC could be the face of presenting it. You know, once we finish, you know, I know Noel, you outlined that we're on our way. Um, but once that's said and we're starting to communicate to folks how to make the most of these resources and whatnot once it's being deployed, I think it'd be a great opportunity to have TPAC folks invited to the school board meeting or whenever that's presented uh, because they are effectively liaisons to every one of these Title I schools uh, with their members. So I, I just wanted to offer that. Maybe you guys can follow up, you know, Mike and others, uh, to see where your role might be in, in taking it even further than where it is already. I did want to ask just in terms of um, the role of the committee in reviewing the policy, the Title I grant policy specifically. Uh, there are, are different charges for TPAC depending on the web page you look at. Um, so I know we're look, focused on the literacy plan right now, but I am curious if that was something you guys discussed at all this year. I'll say we have. We really have. Right. The group, but not in terms of reviewing it, I think. I don't think we've done that. So we, we got an in-depth presentation and information session about it, but we have not taken that on. I mean, it's, I think it's part of my conversation with Dr. Reed over the summer, we kind of tossed around, you know, types of things that the committee could be doing. So it's definitely worthwhile. I mean, well, learning a lot that night and forgetting a whole bunch of it too because it was so much information. What stuck out to me, I remember, and maybe I asked her afterwards but when Ms. White said, it's like $25 million is all that goes to it. I was floored. 25 is not enough, not close to enough. I mean, you shouldn't have PTAs, PTOs, whatever, bailing out underfunded schools. We need a lot more money. Yeah, I think that's where the, we might really benefit from you all taking a look at that. Our internal, I don't know if we call it a policy, I don't know where it's housed, but basically how FCPS chooses to deploy Title I. Um, because the grant is meant to supplement, not supplant. And we're supposed to obviously compensate all kinds of things that are not covered by the federal grant, right, as a part of our own. So that's a chance to look at, you know, what are those percentages? I personally don't know what they are either. but And then looking at, you know, which of the programs we choose to take on. So. Are we distributing funds on the school-wide level so, such that each school gets a certain amount of money and uses it for whatever? Or is it targeted assistance, right, where it's by child? And I know that's not what we do, but we might want to reconsider. Maybe that's a better way of reaching the need. I don't know. But those are opportunities, I think, if we take a look at that, um, that shouldn't be missed, in addition to the threshold, which I know is already in conversation, but I think also needs some reconsideration. I know, my time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Omesh, and uh, we're keenly aware of the importance of looking at how the federal government actually fully funds or does not fund their obligations under um, Title I, the Impact Aid, IDEA, and we can keep on going. So thank you. I think the more we raise awareness to that, the better. Uh, I have two go back so far. And if there are any more, please let me know. My intent is to give people one minute for their go back, um, starting with Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Seismer Heiser. Um, I, one of the things that I was wondering with the charge that you all have, um, I, I totally support the science of reading. But Dr. Reed, I think that given how engaged this committee is, I would really like to consider that there be sort of analysis of the Title I schools, the 41, identifying which ones are showing best in class uh, results in uh, growth of student achievement, and uh, maybe identifying what then can be adopted and um, you know maybe taken into account by the other schools um, because we're always talking about how do we share 
um, best practices. And so I would love to have the committee objectively looking at these 42 schools and saying, what are we seeing in the test data and the trends, and make recommendations on which schools those are. And, um, and then also to look at where some might be struggling and identifying um, the schools where we're not seeing the, that sort of growth and what supports we can bring and why. So that was my added input. I think that's why we stress the importance of making sure every school had a baseline in terms of resources and time to implement it. Because if one school has, as an example, if they have Lexia for a month, another school has it for six months, and then two months later you have some type of assessment, it's not going to be, it's going to be skewed, the information you get. Everybody needs a certain amount of time <clears throat> before you start measuring and assessing what growth is. And that's something that, you know, from a central standpoint, there'll have to be a kind of a tracking to make sure, to make sure of. I think it is useful, I think in the broader sense, to use science of reading within Title I schools and then take lessons learned and, you know, you know, flatten it out or, or distribute it out, but we want to make sure, and that was something we were really sensitive to, we should not be measuring them until we know they have what they need to do the work. Yeah, let me clarify. I wasn't talking about their science of reading results. I'm just talking about their annual test scores that we get um, through the SOLs and things like that, that, you know, it, beyond getting to the science of reading, I, I want to start having a real annual look, and I think you guys are the objective advisory committee to the board to be able to tell us and say, we're looking at our 42, and what's the five-year um, examination of where things are, and then each year keep checking in who's, who's growing and who's not and why. So I was looking at it more globally of just achievement and growth for each of the schools. I think this also goes back to the fourth recommendation about encouraging principals to come to TPAC. And I think if they do come, they will immediately see the inherent value and they'll want to keep coming <laughs> because it's not its not only a chance to learn from parents, but it's also an opportunity to share what they're doing and, and what's working or not. Um, and I think, you know, that could mesh with a process of like identifying who would come. But we did hear from several principals this year, for example, from Forest Edge and Woodlawn, um, who came and told us about how they were rolling out science of reading. We have one very active, um, Anna Del Terrace. Is that where Felicia is? That's no, right. Way, Way in Oak. Way in Oak okay. as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that, that come frequently. I, there's a first grade teacher from my son's school that always calls in, um, and, and which is fun, you know, we can kind of <laughs> tag team. Um, so I, I think, yeah, there is the quantitative data piece, but where I see our true value is in the qualitative, um, being able to share that information and ask questions in sort of a safe environment where we can just be really honest and frank with each other. Again, just to clarify, yeah. If, if you guys are an advisory committee to the board and we want to look at where the 42 are and what their growth is and where the progress is being made to the point about implementation, not just you know, action, exactly. then I think you guys are the place for us to do that. Staff brings you the data, you look at it, and you can you know, bring some recommendations. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, I will urge that um, the Title I Committee is structured slightly different. They do not meet every single month. The Executive Committee does, and so um, putting more on their plate, and part of it is because of the challenges some have to get to the meetings. We need to be very strategic in it, and I think you make an excellent recommendation, but it would be great if the um, staff could kind of take a look at it as they've suggested and come back with a recommendation. Uh, Ms. Seismer Heiser. Thank you, and I'll be brief. I wanted to actually get your feedback uh, when I mentioned the trauma informed forum topic from June 2022. I wanted just to read to you what we had, uh, and the board thankfully had passed. I want to read to you what we had directed the staff to do just to see you hear your thoughts. And it was a systematic trauma informed policy and approach to address the rising issue of anxiety disorders that was in place before COVID through COVID. It directs school leadership to develop trauma-informed policy, regulations, and incorporate trauma-informed practices into curriculum with a holistic approach that supports every student's potential. So I just, that's, I would love to hear your feedback as you looked at this, whether you think that's a, a good approach or just hear your thoughts. 
And I know I'm putting you on the spot, so it's okay if you like. No, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a great idea, but my concern is, so you're challenging, well, school leaders, you mean principals are supposed to develop. It would be the central office leadership. Central office, okay. Yeah. So does that mean central office has been sufficiently trauma-informed? I mean, it would be for central office to develop the policy and practices, and then it, the implementation will be training everybody. Right, but I want to make sure that central office itself has that capacity and understands what it is it'd be developing. So that's, that's why I'm asking. It's a great question. I think the central office um, certainly understands trauma. Um, the practices, Dr. Presidio, you have a, several folks who are expert in that area, is that correct? We do have a trauma-informed specialist, and we have a project team that works on that, but I, I do think the comments about building everybody's capacity are really important, including central office staff yeah. capacity. Um, we need more than a few people who understand the work deeply and understand it well, and we're continuing to try to build that central office capacity while supporting schools at the same time. So I would say I think we've made taken some good first steps, and there's a lot more work to do, to your point. That's now, a great question. And I was at an ACES Adverse Child Experience conference back in 2019, and I was able to interact with and, and you know, connect with some trauma-informed you know, specialists who provide those resources. So it's been on my mind for a while, and it's something that Dr. Reed and I have kind of communicated about and will continue to talk about. So absolutely, I like where you're going. I just think that we need to make sure that folks, they understand exactly what it entails. No, that's an excellent point. I, and I appreciate that feedback because if you don't understand it well, how do you then implement it and train others and know that's being implemented properly? So that was what I, I appreciate that. I'm glad I asked that question. So that was really my main point. Um, I really appreciate everything you brought in the work you do. And I look forward to um, helping Dr. Reed look at these recommendations and make sure that you know we're implementing the changes that we need to do and really lifting up the schools where the greatest needs are. So thank you. And I do want to say encourage principals, mm -hmm. even before it was encouraged. I don't want it to come down like a, a mandate. I think if it's discussed and shared from leadership level and then Title I as they meet with them, emphasize the importance, I think it'll come. You know, but you don't want to seem like we're coming around and say make them come because they really do get value out of it if they show up. And that's, that's the part of our meetings. We never, we just about always run out of time before we're done talking. The challenge was getting people there, and really it was getting people informed about what we are, what we do. Once people show up, we're in good shape. So thank you very much. This is, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. I look forward to continuing to working with you. Um, out of tonight's meeting, uh, there are a couple of things that I think were really emphasized. Uh, the importance of better communication about what we are doing in the science of reading and bringing our families along um, so that they can be uh, part of the solution and understand it as well as encourage the best practices at home. Um, as well as um, something that came up about, uh, it was the very first question that Mr. Frisch asked about, do we have a state standard? Um, and we do, but there is work going on this summer uh, to, for the adoption of the basal materials for the science of reading. Um, and that's where I think your committee could play a really important role of having somebody active in that review process. Um, the third area is the, um, the sharing of best practices um, in a more consistent and deliberate manner because as it is now, and um, Mike, you're one of the best salespeople I know on encouraging people to get involved. Um, I wish I could clone you uh, and put you across the I whole. I do too. <laughs> I could save my time. <laughs> I know, but but it's so important that we actually um, find a um, a structured process for ensuring that we share those best practices, um, and getting people into the room with you is going to be critical. So thank you. Um, I don't see any other. I do see Ms. Amesh's placard up. I'm going to give her um, one minute, and um, then we will close out this session. We will take a five-minute break. Okay, well, I'll give Ms. Okay. 
Um, and then we'll take a five minute break. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, I guess just to bring uh, the point on the Title One piece home, anyone from staff, the 25 million, is that the federal grant? Okay, so then how much are, do we as FCPS supplement that every year? Do we have a set number? So we do not, so the Title I federal grant is the Title I federal grant, and we don't supplement, FCPS doesn't supplement that. Um, the majority of our grant does go to the schools, um, the vast majority, so when we determine the number of schools, we determine the allocations, and then lots of what was talked about today is when we talk about the embedded um, professional learning that we're seeing at like Hutchison and Clearview and many, many other schools, that's all as a result of our schools using their Title I funds to staff literacy specialists. They also staff math specialists. Many of them are, um, are uh, funding positions to support student wellness, additional social workers, school counselors, um, and so that's how that $25 million is used. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your candor there because I think part of where I'm concerned and where I think there could be some value add in looking at it is some of that stuff we're supposed to be funding already, like to get the counselor ratio or the social worker ratio up to a certain point or interpreters or math and reading specialists, et cetera. On the school level, ideally, that's a resource we've already committed. That's something we should have. And for us to dip into the Title I pot to hire those individuals is where I have a little bit of concern. It's perfectly legal, I know, but that's where I'm having an issue with, then maybe we should be targeting those, those monies towards specific, like, I don't know, tutoring hours or something that can support those students specifically. And, and keeping in mind that there are a lot of Title I eligible kids that are in schools that don't qualify as Title I either. But if thank we're choosing you, to Amish. do these right sums at schools, we lose that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tolan. All they wanted to do was um, mention that Region 1, I know Ray Lynette is running kind of a collaborative look at what's happening across the schools in that region. And, I, and I've heard from the school-based people it's super, super helpful. Thank you. So this part of our work session is now concluded. We will take a five minute break and we will uh, start at 815 for the final um, uh, report. What is the All right, everybody, thanks for hanging in there. We have one last report to go, so um, I appreciate all your patience and our board members. I know there's only seven of us, so we need to take breaks in between for the board. So I will go ahead and turn it over to staff to present the report, and then we'll move from there. Well, thank you so much. Did you? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the lead on this one. And um, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to bring the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee, which we will refer to as FLECAC, um, during this presentation. Thanks for the opportunity to bring uh, this year's report. As you can see on the slide here, this one is a little bit unusual. You'll see it's a review of the report that was created uh, by the school year 21-22 committee, as well as the committee from this year. So you're getting two for the price of one tonight. So um, we have lots to share with you. If you'll go ahead and, and oh, I have the clicker, sorry. Sorry about that. Oh. So we're going to start off just reminding people a little about a little bit about family life education in Fairfax County, and then an overview of the FLECAC. 
Um, we're going to talk, as I said, about the revisions to the recommendations from the committee that were in 2122. Um, and as just a quick reminder, um, about a year ago, we were together to look at those recommendations, and there was some significant recommendations for change, including um, the suggestion for gender combined instruction in grades four through eight. And the board um, decided that the best thing to do was to take a little bit more time to ensure that we have public comment that was happening during, um, during the school year and not during the summer. Uh, so we did that, and we are um, going to be bringing you tonight some revised recommendations. We will also bring you some recommendations um, about uh, consent. So this year's committee also took on some new work, and that is around boundaries and consent. So we'll be bringing those recommendations to you, and then we'll follow up with next steps for the board. I just want to take a moment to um, recognize that I think you all know Dr. Presidio. He's with us uh, tonight, as well as Ms. Carrie Reynolds, who is our coordinator for health, PE, family life, and driver's education. So she has quite a few things on her plate, um, and she also serves as the, um, the chair of this committee. So as a quick reminder, family life education in Fairfax, um, we use a local, a local uh, curriculum. So it is based on the Virginia guidelines and the standards, but it is a curriculum um, that we create here in Fairfax. And each year, when we want to make any changes, we bring those changes to the school board uh, for your consideration. Part of that process is always a 30-day uh, review period. So we typically bring you the recommendations, then there's a 30-day review period, and then we bring it back um, to you all for vote. Um, the uh, curriculum coordinator does gather um, a team after the recommendations are approved to create the new curriculum uh, and professional development that's needed. And the other thing to remember about our family life education is that parents do have the right to opt their child out of any FLE lesson, either one or all of the lessons. Now, FLECAC, as you'll notice, that the three of us are here and there are no parents with us uh, because FLECAC is not a school board advisory board in the same sense as your other advisories. It is really an advisory to the curriculum coordinator. So FLECAC gathers and they make recommendations um, to Ms. Reynolds, and then Ms. Reynolds brings them for you all to actually approve. And they're different. You'll notice that the kinds of recommendations you hear from the other committee are sometimes big and oversweeping, and these are really very intentional. The, the kinds of things we bring to you are about objectives, new subjects, media. So it's a very different, it's a curriculum recommendations that we're bringing forward to you all. Um, for this year, the school year members, you can see we had community members that included um, uh, nine of you were able to appoint this year. Uh, the county council of PTAs, the health department, and representatives from local clergy and practicing physicians. So we have a variety of different stakeholders uh, and as well as school-based administrators and teachers. And then we also have students. Now the students only do serve a one-year term as opposed to a two-year term. And as I stated before, Ms. Reynolds is the chairperson. They do meet monthly, and the meetings are open to the public. So the two things, as I said, we've broken this presentation into two parts, and I will take the first one really talking about the recommendations from the Fleet CAC 2122, and then how um, what was suggested that year and how this year's committee has revised those recommendations. And then Ms. Reynolds will talk about the new objectives related to setting and respecting boundaries and consent. So as a reminder, there were seven recommendations that were made by last year's committee. Obviously, the first one is the most significant around um, the adoption of gender combined instruction for the human growth and development unit in grades four through eight. So that was a very significant um, recommendation to you all, as I mentioned earlier. There were also some others that were related. Um, accessing modified curriculum will be gender separate for explicit instruction. So the, the committee decided that there are some things that would not be um, combined. There also was some information around uh, the testicular self-exam at 10th grade. Just for your knowledge, uh, grade nine and 10 are gender combined um, for the majority of the curriculum at this time. 
there was also some uh, smaller changes, some more technical changes that I'll talk through. Uh, then there was some media that was also looked at. The final recommendation was the suggestion that in the future, a future FLECAC might consider exploring um, gender identity in elementary school FLE um, to create a more inclusive FLE curriculum overall. So these, again, were the re recommendations of the committee from school year 21-22. And these are the recommendations that went out for community review. As I mentioned, each time with FLECAC, they bring their, uh, their recommendations, we bring them to you, and then we have a 30-day open community review period. So during that time, they're posted and information goes out and people um, uh, submit their comments. We've done it in different ways as far as how they submit comments. For this year, um, we wanted to have it during the school year, so we opened it from October 31st to December 1st. We did receive 2,656 res um, responses. Um, the, the way that the um, community input, sometimes we leave it very open, but this time we did provide a little bit of structure to it. So question one asked for the level of support for gender combined instruction, realizing that was the um, most significant change. And then questions two through six were open-ended responses. So that period was open. And well, even before I get to this, what happened with those results is we took all of the results and we asked, um, subcommittee of Bleak Hack to kind of go in and help us to summarize all of those comments. And those were brought forward. So we'll share a little bit. I mean, this is the overarching and probably something that um, uh, is the most easy to see being quantitative um, of the level of support. Now, we do have more detailed and disaggregated data that you'll find in the report on page six and in the appendices, um, but this data definitely showed that from the 2,000 plus um, responses, overwhelmingly, um, there was a do not support for the gender combined. But the independent comments, we wanted to just highlight some of the themes that sort of emerged. These were some of the themes for people who opposed gender combined or some of the recommendations is, is really, as you can see, about students, right? About students being embarrassed or uncomfortable, um, that they might not be mature enough to hear about such topics in, in um, uh, combined classrooms that some parents would really uh, feel the need to opt their students out, uh, whereas they might not have if we kept it gender separate. Certainly concerned with boys, about girls in class with boys, confusing um, students about gender. Um, and then there were some comments around gender identity should not be instructed in elementary school. And I just want to be clear that there's nothing in these recommendations that say we would be teaching gender identity in elementary school as part of FLE. Um, so that was a common theme, but uh, I just want to clarify that that's not part of the suggested changes at this time. There were also some comments supporting, and you can kind of see the reasons. I think these really aligned with some of the research that we shared with you last year and through other reports about just normalizing puberty and reproduction um, and taking away that sort of unknown about the other gender, fostering understanding among students and increasing empathy for what others might experience and being more inclusive and just less stigma and shame um, that can be associated with puberty. We also wanted to get students involved, and um, so we went into schools and we talked to about 48 students, which, I, again, it's not a ton of students, um, but we did try and get some of their feelings about things, and there were 25 elementary school, eight middle school students, and 15 high school students, and, and they also had some concern about being awkward um, and embarrassing and uncomfortable, which is not, um, not typical with a first response. Um, there was also some people, some of the students who thought it would probably be okay and that it might promote some understanding and, and reduce stigma. So there were some mixed, some mixed feelings from the students, for sure. So what I was going to do now, all of this information that I just shared with you was shared with the entire current year flea CAC because we wanted them to have the community review and re-engage with the recommendations from last year to see if they would put forward the same recommendations or make some revisions. And you'll see in recommendation one, on the left, I've, I've listed what the original recommendation was that combined 
gender combined in grades four through eight, and on the right-hand side, you will see um, the revision. So I am gonna go through this one a little bit slowly, because again, I think this is a significant um, change. And the grade four, um, the committee suggested that we keep grade four gender separate, that we don't combine starting that first year. I think you can, um, I think there was a feeling that the first time students are hearing this in a classroom setting might not be the best time to have gender combined. There is really only one lesson in grade four, but it would remain gender separate. In grade five, they suggested that they stay separate for three lessons, and those lessons are on the topics of, puber uh, topics of puberty, reproductive system, and human reproduction, so they would be separate, but we would begin to combine them for things around abstinence and sexually tr uh, transmitted infections, sort of having a, a um, realization of which topics might be more sensitive to kids and again, but starting to build a little bit of um, that common understanding. And then grades six through eight, we would um, gender, be gender combined for all lessons. That's five lessons in grade six and four in, in grades seven and eight. And the topics are listed there, they're similar. There's also a um, grade eight that also includes content on contraception in addition to the topics listed. So they definitely took their time. I think this was probably, Ms. Reynolds would agree, the thing that they spent the most time on really trying to refine that original recommendation and take into consideration the data and um, the research that was provided. I'll move to the other ones. Oh, I think I kind of talked about this as I went through, um, but just some of the reasons why they decided really about that normalizing um, uh, gender combined instruction. There were some more specific recommendations. You'll see on the left last year, um, uh, the change for this year was there was no change. They wanted to retain the same, the same recommendation as last year's committee, where the students would be receiving instruction from the modified curriculum will continue in gender separate for explicit instruction on the use of menstrual pads and viewing media. So this is the level of detail that they went into, really looking at very specific groups of students and very specific information, what might stay gender combined and what might um, uh, be gender separate. There was another suggestion. Um, currently, um, boys and girls are separate in grade 10 for testicular self-exam video that the boys see. And the recommendation last year was really to remove the video. It's out of date. We don't have streaming rights. It's not, um, it's not something that we want to continue to use. And the idea is to go ahead and combine um, the 10th graders and learn about both breast and testicular cancer together. Um, Recommendations four and five are more technical. And basically, if the board decided to um, move forward with gender combined, we'd have to go in and do technical changes to both objectives, that would be what's in bold, and descriptive statements to remove places where they talk about, um, um, I'm sorry, that's not what this one is, sorry. We revise the objective for grade 10 um, to include gender identity. So you'll see in the bold, it says development of sexuality and gender identity. We were suggesting that we add the words gender identity to the objective because you will see that it's already included in the descriptive statement and then therefore the lesson. So we don't think that the objective is as transparent to students and, and families um, as they're making decisions about opt out. So that's a, a technical change really just to clean up language for that objective. This next one, which is just a lot of words, so, and I know I have a lot of words to say too, but if the board were to decide to move forward with gender um, combined instruction, we would need to clean up objectives and descriptive statements to remove everywhere where it refers to gender separate, girls only, boys only. So again, this is a technical change. Um, full, if you wanted to see all the different ways that would represent, this is one example, 6.1, you could see that in Appendix H of the report. Grade six is a media. Um, I, this is not a, um, I don't think this is a, a big change, but we do have um, a media called Hormones, Body Odor, and Acne Oh My. Um, it's a Puberty 101 that the group last year suggested that we use in both six and seven. When the committee looked at it this year, they thought it would be better just to use it in seven. We already have some media in six, and to watch the same video twice didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so there was a, a revision recommendation. And this final recommendation really was um, that FLECAC um, suggested that future FLECACs might want to explore the inclusion of gender identity in elementary family life education. Not, they were not recommending it be added, they were recommended exploration of that. 
as well as a second task for a future fleet CAC is really to make recommendations for the development of a more inclusive curriculum to ensure that all students um, are able to understand and access um, our family life education. And there was no change to that recommendation. So there's the seven original recommendations as well as the revisions from um, this current year's fleet CAC. I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Reynolds to talk about the, the new content that this year's committee has, um, is putting forward. Yeah, so in addition to all of that, we also um, continued some work that was actually started a little bit in the 21-22 school year, but we got to, um, much further this year in our discussion around objectives that would support um, personal boundaries and consent. So the work to enhance this instruction, as I just said, began with the 21-22 school year. And what we were able to accomplish that year is we pulled all of the current objectives and descriptive statements that related to those topics. And we had a chance for the Fleet CAC members um, to look at those, provide some input on where they thought there might need to be changes, what they thought was important at the different grade levels related to boundaries and consent. And we also saw input from school counseling staff and staff in the Office of Equity and Employee Relations. Um, once we had all that input, staff and instructional services took the feedback, took our current objectives, and drafted um, some revised objectives, and in some cases, some new objectives that we could bring forward to the committee this year for discussion. At the start of the year, we did have a presentation from Ms. Bethany Demers on the Fairfax County Youth Survey data, which we thought was relevant to many of these topics, um, and we wanted to have that as a foundation to ground some of our work. Um, so then we worked on reviewing and revising, and we were able to complete um, our recommendations for kindergarten through grade eight during this year. So what we're, I would like to do is I'm going to share with you um, some of the key ideas and the themes by grade level bands. If you would like to look at the specific recommendations, they are also included in the report. Most of these changes, um, Noel those was just talking about changes that would be in the Human Growth and Development Unit. Most of these changes would be in our Emotional and Social Health Unit, which is the second of the two um, Family Life Education Units. There are um, two objectives that where consent is actually included in a lesson in abstinence at grade six and one at grade eight, and those are in human growth and development. There are also um, lessons at both of those grade levels in emotional and social health. So we're really talking mostly about emotional and social health with a couple of exceptions. So some of the key ideas that the committee was very intentional with as they move through each of those grade levels um, was looking at the differentiating between trustworthy and trusted adults. We wanted students to be able to understand what might make somebody trustworthy, but then also be able to recognize who a trusted adult is for them as an individual. Um, and certainly in our very early grades, giving examples of who trusted adults may be, and then helping students to be able to identify who those trusted adults are in their lives, because they may not be the same individuals from one person to the next. Um, we wanted to use concepts of body autonomy and body boundaries. So students are really recognizing that their body belongs to them. They have the right to make choices about their own bodies and ultimately in terms of consent to say no um, to individuals who may be approaching them, touching them, whatever, in inappropriate ways or ways that make them feel uncomfortable. Um, inclusion of ways to communicate no for nonverbal students. Currently, the curriculum is very much you say no. Well, we know not all of our students are able to say no, so we wanted to make sure we recognized other ways that students may be communicating and supporting them and understanding how to do that as well. Um, looking at the language, um, our current language is safe and unsafe, or I'm sorry, our current language is comfortable and uncomfortable, which may be challenging to understand, so we were looking for some other language that might help students understand those concepts. Um, and the words that they, the committee came up with was safe and unsafe and additional to comfortable and uncomfortable, um, thinking that that might aid understanding by our younger students um, and other students who may just not understand um, fully comfortable or uncomfortable. Really introducing the word consent and earlier Right now, I don't think the word consent actually appears in the curriculum until high school, so using that word and that terminology much earlier in our curriculum, along with the idea of hearing and respecting no. So we're teaching students to say no. We also want to teach them that if somebody says no to them, they need to hear what that individual is saying and respect the other person's um, boundaries. 
and then introducing sexual harassment um, in the middle school level. So looking at our grade levels, kindergarten through grade three, some of the concepts that we see um, scaffolded throughout those grade levels is how to say no and respond to behaviors that might make them feel uncomfortable or unsafe. Those characteristics of trustworthy adults and identifying the adults they trust. And we want students to really identify the individuals for themselves and be able to name who those people are. Um, differentiating when expressions of affection are appropriate and when they are inappropriate. Responding to inappropriate electronic messages or pictures are introduced in grade one. We know a lot of students are using electronic devices much earlier um, at younger ages and understanding that there are inappropriate messages that they may be receiving and how to respond to that. And then how they can set, communicate, and respect bound body boundaries um, introduced in grade three. In the upper elementary, grades four through six, um, they'll start to learn about warning signs of threatening or uncomfortable situations and how they can respond. Child abuse, specifically emotional, social, physical, and financial abuse, um, along with neglect, is introduced in fifth grade. Consent and bodily autonomy is also introduced in fifth grade. And then trusted adults as well as resources for help and looking at resources that are available to them both in the school and in the community. In the middle school, grades seven and eight, we have, we're introducing sexual harassment in grade seven. Um, really getting into that idea of respecting when someone does not give consent or if they withdraw consent, changing their mind that you, can, you need to respect that as well. Um, exploitation and situational awareness being introduced in grade eight and again continuing with resources for help. So some future flea cack topics. Um, for next year, explore, possibly explore inclusion of gender identity at elementary. We've heard that idea already. Um, we will continue and finish the work on the objectives and descriptive statements around boundaries and consent at the high school. And then making recommendations to enhance the curriculum to better meet the needs of students with disabilities, our English language learners, and students with diverse backgrounds. There are some needs in our curriculum to make it more inclusive, make it more accessible by students um, from a variety of different um, backgrounds and different individual needs. That is the combination of the two parts that um, I shared we would be covering tonight. Um, tonight is obviously not a decision making, it's really an opportunity for you all to ask questions um, of us. Um, thinking about what it might look like as we move forward with this, once we are ready, we would bring forward um, a new business item to the school board. And then we do need to have another community review period, which is a 30-day review period on the consent objectives. Those have not gone out to the community. Um, so the part that Carrie just shared with you. Um, and then it would come back for school board action and um, curriculum development professional learning would take some time depending on which parts of this we put forward and then full implementation. So you'll notice there's no timeline um, because we know that um, this is going to take some time to, to process and um, we just wanted to kind of lay out the next steps without the timeline to be determined at this point. So we're ready for questions. Thank you. And before I turn it over to you, I just want to turn to Dr. Reed to make sure there's anything you want to add to that before we turn to board member questions. Am I repeating that, Noel, for just a quick second? I apologize. No, I was just saying that we do not have a set timeline for okay. moving forward, but the next steps really will be to come um, to bring what whatever parts of this to new business, have another review period um, on the consent um, so we can get community input and then um, move forward with a vote. And then it does take time to do curriculum development, professional development, and implementation. Would All of this would have to be timed out um, into the future, which there is no set date at this point. Thank you, Noelle, and I appreciated that. I, I caught the last part of that, and I thought, I want to make sure that, anyhow, so I appreciate that. And I want to share with the board as well that uh, Dr. Presidio and I have had several conversations about just how hard FLECAC has worked on um, these topics this year and the prior years. And um, obviously it's a very sensitive topic as well. So we wanna recognize that. I do know that uh, we've discussed that we are not ready to move forward for a vote at this time, uh, that we feel like it's important uh, to 
really be thoughtful about what professional development might look like in terms of preparing staff for a shift of this nature, potentially, um, as well as our opt-out practices and looking at what's, uh, what model or what uh, abilities we might have to make sure that really important content is taught in ways that feel like safe spaces for our students. So. Um, I think both the PD, the opt-out model, and just making sure that um, as we, you know, take this close look at that, that when we do roll this out, that perhaps we even, uh, so anyhow, that we're really ready to be thoughtful about it. So I, I think what we need to do is a little more research, and to your point, Noel, um, I think make sure that our PD plan looks uh, is complete and thoughtful that our um, pacing guides would be thoughtful around that in the opt-out model. So I think what we'd like to do is uh, do some work on that with staff and then come back perhaps later in the fall uh, with another update and report to the board at that time for possible placement um, on a board agenda uh, moving forward in the future. Dr. Presidio, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I mean, I think that sufficiently covers it. The, the one other thing that Noel had al also mentioned is that we do need to do that additional community review period uh, for that second set of recommendations that the committee worked on regarding consent and boundaries. So that's another piece that we'll have to work into that timeline. It's also my understanding, I think, that this is phase one of the consent and boundary uh, work. And I don't know, at some point, I know you were looking at another, well, phase two, <laughs> probably, um, in the secondary realm. But even deepening that work, I think, in uh, phase one a little bit in terms of, again, what does it look like, not just the targets, but what would instruction potentially look like and what would that curriculum potentially you know, be thoughtful about. So I really appreciate the thoughtfulness um, because what we want to do is make sure we're doing this really well um, because uh, that's important. So thank you, Dr. Presidio, and thank you, Ms. Clemenko and Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And with that, um, I will turn to my board members for questions. So I'll start with Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. Marin. Thank you. Um, I will tell you in eight years of being a board member, and or almost eight years and um, a good 12 years prior to that um, of attending these meetings this is the first time that I can ever remember not having parents and citizen members attend as part of the um, presentation so I'm a little surprised there usually are some members of the flea CAC in the audience somewhere there's this is the first time um, actually have a member of the committee here okay. in the audience. I, I'm sorry, we didn't. I apologize for not introducing them. Okay, so, you so that know. would be mm -hmm. my first. Um, and, and the reason I mention that is because uh, one of your recommendations is to go back out to the community for your second um, area of recommendations. Um, we went out to the community on your recommendations here. And the recommendations were that 84.68% of those that were um, surveyed didn't support it. And that um, there were limited support in the student groups as well because of concerns about anxiety and the need for privacy. So I guess my, cons my approach to this is slightly different in that um, rather than looking at the opt-out approach when 84% have already said they would probably opt-out, is that we need a parallel model, a model that allows for people who want a joint curriculum to be able to do that, but that the focus is on respecting what the feedback has been from that. And part of this is in reading the report it, the report actually says that there is no best practices um, that says that this is the approach we should be taking. And so my concern is that we need to go slow and be more deliberate, and having that parallel process is probably one that meets the needs of our community. Um, and then, because I am concerned that we want to make sure people get access to this very important curriculum in a safe and nurturing environment. The second thing is that um, you, the consent piece, which I fully support. 
Um, however, several years ago, we had long discussions. Ms. Corbin Sanders, your time was up. Okay, I, I apologize. Need a, a go back. That's absolutely on the list. Thank you. Sorry, my apologies, um, Ms. Marin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is certainly a long time coming, and I wonder if that's why perhaps there aren't you know, as many of the community members uh, here, although I certainly appreciate people coming tonight. I think the way that this information was presented in a respectful, thoughtful, research-based way and transparently is, is um, an example of how the expectation is, what the expectation is for how it will be presented in our classrooms. Um, you know, the information here is about safety, it's about health, it's also about confidence of our students. It's to make sure that students have information so they're not uninformed or misinformed, even if that's you know, un unintentional, and certainly to combat bias. Um, I think about my own kids now and um, you know, what if students learned more than my generation did about other genders? Um, I think this is a step towards further accepting everyone and understanding people's biology. I mean, it's just straight up biology. I think too, I was just thinking about how I used to try and steal my dad's cigarettes to throw them away. And that was in the 80s and 90s, that was the big health thing. Well now, I can count on multiple, you know, 10 times over how many women I know who have breast cancer and survived. And you know what, they're moms in FCPS. So I think talking about it, normal, I don't even wanna say the word normalizing, it's just, you know, our culture is how it is um, and, you know, there's other ways to appreciate and learn about these really necessary health um, pieces. I'm glad that parents will always have the option to opt out. I also really appreciate about consent because when we hear discipline cases from the board, sometimes things come because perhaps there was misunderstanding about what consent means. So this is again something that the school division has to address because our students are presenting with these challenges. So I am eager to move these forward into practice to get the curriculum designed and the training delivered and the families um, educated to know what their, their options are for our students. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin? Before I comment, I do have a quick question. Um, do we have survey results from our staff, the FLE um, instructors, on how they felt about um, combined classes? And staff received, all teachers received the, the same survey as the community did, and they could indicate on there if they were an employee of FCPS. Um, but we did not specifically send something to our FLE teachers to receive their responses separately. Okay, uh, well, looking at the report, I don't see any data on the staff responses. So if somebody can comment yeah, on that. Yeah, I don't know that we disaggregated by staff members. Carrie, can you? But if we haven't, we still have the data. So is that something we can go back and, um, and share with the board? Yeah, uh, Dr. Reed, I think that'd be really important because we're talking about 86% of responses, but we should see what the responses are by staff who teach this instruction and then the parents and students. So, um, you know, I, I'm one of those board members that constantly ask about research best practice and how can that drive our decision making. And so, um, while I appreciate that this was revisited and you guys carried out what you did, um, what is concerning to me is the lack of research, that there isn't anything talking about at the elementary school level, what's the research and best practice for doing it. It looks like there are school divisions that are, so if there isn't any research or best practice that's been published, then why don't we go get from those school divisions, what was that change in that transition from going from single sex to combined, how did that work for them, and maybe what we could learn from it. Um, I would say given the, ex the extraordinary responses of people not wanting this, um, and we, we are a representative body of the board representing the community, um, you know, it, it is concerning to me to turn around and just throw that out, especially when we don't have research and best practice to then say, well, it's just because you just don't understand. Um, because we have opt out, I don't want to risk 86% of our students and our families opting out. 
So I would agree with Ms. Corbett Sanders that, and I believe Mr. Presidio, that, or Dr. Presidio, that Ms. Dernat Koufax had asked in a prior conversation that if it's that small of a number that would like to have it gender combined, then maybe we offer that and do it in a pilot setting and see if how that grows and gets done. But with 200 schools, well, 150 elementary, I don't want to experiment with 150 right out of the gate to just make a change when the, the survey results don't tell us they can support it. So, and I'll need to go back. This is like speed talking. <laughs> no worries, I got you on the list, Megan. If I, um, if I could just respond to a couple of those Please, please, Dr. Presidio, go ahead. Um, comments. Uh, first, I would say uh, I definitely take your point about the research, but I do want to point out for folks that might be watching this in the community that we do have, in addition to the presentation materials, we do have a full report posted on Board Docs that does contain the definitive research that we were able to locate independently and with our independent research partners um, like EAB. So there's just not a lot of published research available, uh, but we pulled really those seminal studies that are available. And I think what you'll see in those studies is pretty much what we encapsulated in the slides. There's benefits, there's challenges and concerns, and we tried to capture those in the slides. So I know that it's not really sufficient in terms of what we would like to be able to point to to, to research, but we did pull um, what we could. And I would also say, you know, the, some of the questions that you're raising, Ms. Corbett Sanders raised about different ways to implement, whether it's a pilot or a different model, um, those are certainly things that we can consider. As Dr. Reed said, you know, the intent was to try to get feedback from the board tonight and direction from the board as a body um, about how we would move forward. So, you know, we're just presenting the recommendations from the committee um, as they came from the committee tonight. So thank you for bringing up some of those those points. All right, but just to clarify, I, I went through the report and I didn't Mr. see Coffin. elementary school. Mr. So can, no, I would like that clarified for the public and for me. Do we have research on elementary schools having gender combined? I did not see any research on elementary school gender combined classes. Uh, most of the research we were able to find was with older students, not with elementary students. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Mr. Frisch? Thank you. First, on the issue of consent, I'm curious why uh, developmentally appropriate instruction on exploitation doesn't begin until eighth grade. I think most parents would tell you that there's significant concerns younger than that, too. Um, I do think we, we don't maybe don't use the word explicitly exploitation in the younger grades, but we do, for example, begin our instruction on teen sex trafficking in the sixth grade, which certainly um, has ties to exploitation. And um, but we could, I mean, we could certainly consider being more intentional in that in instruction at a younger grade. I think that's worth considering, and also seeing the alignment with social media usage in that work. Uh, which is obviously something that impacts students much younger than that. We uh, do have um, we do have lessons in our general health curriculum starting as early as third grade um, that talks about social media and electronic diff gaming, different types of ways students are interacting online, and that, um, that's something students can't opt out of. Along the lines of consent, this board voted to request a a method of training all students on Title IX. So um, I think if we're gonna have a conversation about consent, that's something that needs to be followed up with um, at some point. Um, in terms of um, the question of, of gender integrated um, family life education, this is something that is done in varying ways all over the country and all over the Commonwealth from rural counties to more urban counties, is that right? Is there are several school divisions that do provide gender combined instruction? And there are states that require it, like Missouri and, and California and others, right? Yes. Um, I think what's different and what we don't get from the recommendations is how they do it, right? And so, um, what I would want to have a conversation with or have the superintendent look into is, you know, what are the methods um, that have been most uh, effective in those school divisions? Have those conversations. Um, and, and let the board know the different ways that it's been implemented because that's something that's lacking. Um, on the question of the survey, let's, let's get frank about the survey. How was feedback for the recommendations solicited and how is that different from family surveys? 
So a community um, review period is not a survey, right? And it's not sent directly to, um, to families. It is fanned out through our FCPS communications, um, but it's open to anyone in, you know, anyone who has a computer who has the link can provide us information. I, um, Carrie could, could talk about what demographics that we collected. We asked if you were a parent or a community member, correct? I mean, we asked those questions um, to disaggregate, but there's no assurances. But we go to greater lengths when we do staff surveys or family surveys to guarantee that that's who those people are, right? Yeah, it wasn't intended. This was, you know, it was really um, done as we have always done a FLECAC sort of community review as opposed to a survey particularly, um, which is something else that could have been done to, be, um, to get to every family or to attempt to get to every family, but it was done more of a community review. So if I'm a Reddit warrior in uh, Wyoming, and I have two cell phones, a laptop, an iPad, and maybe web access over my television, I could submit answers to this survey as many times as I have access to a, a device. Yeah, we have no guarantee that the people reside in, in Fairfax County. And I raised this, as I raised, I think people would agree, every time we talk about survey data, I talk about the efficacy of the data and whether it is representative of anything other than the people who filled out the survey. This is particularly troublesome because people are presenting it as family research, research from our families, when there is no way to say that it is family, I'm not saying you did, uh, whether it is families who filled out the survey, whether they live in Fairfax County at all. The only guarantee that we have is that the same IP address did not fill out the survey more than once. Um, and so I hope in the future as we embark on these that we take a, a closer look at the way that we engage the community, the community, families, staff, et cetera, so that we're actually able to speak to what the data represents. What the data represents is that more than 2,000 people from wherever filled this out, and this is what they said. But that's about as reliable as anything else that you put online. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Do you want to go back? We'll see. Dr. Priscilla, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to give one more point of information, and, and I really appreciate Mr. Frisch's questions and comments about the, you know, the validity of, of the information based on the methodology that we use to, um, to collect it. And one other piece that we were just sidebarring about here um, that I just wanted to make sure that the committee was aware of, or that the board and the community is aware of, is that an individual member on FLECAC did do kind of an independent survey, if you will, of FLE teachers in that particular pyramid, and there were some concerns that were raised. But I want to make sure that that information is part of this discussion, but that was not something that the FLECAC committee did or authorized or ran. So um, that is a piece of information I think that maybe some folks were, were curious about, so we just wanted to make sure that everybody had that information tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Fish, let me know if you want to go back. I'll start with, um, I'll take my turn and then we will, go. oh, I'm sorry, Elaine. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things very quickly. Um, I would like to follow up with what Mr. Fish was saying. I think given that, that we really don't have elementary school research that we can look at, it would be super helpful to just for me anyway to hear more about how other school districts are actually implementing this so you know which has already been mentioned um, on the consent piece I um, fully support this I mean having dropped off you know two different young men at college um, you know where you walk in the dorm and immediately there are signs plastered everywhere no means no you know it's like is this the first time these kids are hearing about this when they're going to college that is a big problem so um, you know the more that we can do um, to help our students understand you know these uncomfortable situations and what that means and you know the, the all the list of bullets that you had I think is super important so I um, appreciate that work and I just want to share that in Appendix B, I believe it is, we do include um, information about other school divisions, um, about what they're, how they're currently implementing and at what grade levels. So. Thank you. Abar? Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I just wanted to start by, start by making sure that we, we ground ourselves in the idea that 
saying opt out is an option. I don't think that's like a lot, last resort. We want our kids to be learning this material in school, and we want to make sure we're catering it in a way that is inclusive to all children. Um, so just putting that out there. I, I did want to ask why the vote on this is delayed, though, or like why we don't have an idea of when that's coming. Well, we, we wanted to have this conversation, right, to see when we're ready. We also know that um, we had public comment on last year's committees, but we, did, we have not had our comment period on the consent and, and boundary objectives, which will be a 30-day period. So once we get scheduled for a new business, then we would have the public comment, and then we would have the follow-up. So it's just about a matter of, of scheduling it when it would be appropriate to bring it to the board. In the fall, presumably? Presumably, but yeah. Um, okay. I also just want to be clear that I guess this, the single FLECAC member that was here was not asked nor invited to be here. So to Ms. Corbett Sanders' point, I think that's just important to note. Um, so good to hear that FLE teachers were surveyed. What were the outcomes of that survey? Well, that, that I can't tell you other than because that was not done on behalf or by FLECAC. That was done by an individual member. My understanding, and I just recently learned about this myself, my understanding that there were concerns about how to do that uh, based on some of the teachers that responded to that. But again, I've not seen the survey. I don't know what the questions were, and I don't know what the results were. Okay. Um, I guess based on what we have employee-wise, 88% of employees, it's 100 out of 114 say they do not support. So that's a, a data point if we don't have more than that. Um, but I, I mean, I guess I, I also wanted to point out when looking at the data, black, Hispanic, Asian, native were overwhelmingly do not support. So I, I think I, it's weird that we disaggregate it by race anyway. But if we look at it that way, it's largely middle-aged white individuals who are supporting at all. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too about our cultural responsiveness in the community and what you know we're choosing to do and and who we're choosing to hear from in what we're doing because I I just I mean I genuinely okay the research we have is tenuous I don't who wrote the lit review I'd like to know so we collected the information I believe we we worked with our library services to help us do some of the um, research and make sure that we um, yeah I'm sorry Oh yes, and we do work with um, an independent researcher who also pulled together some of the research for us. Um, maybe our, and then our health and PE, our health and PE team put together the, um, the synopsis. Okay, so it's 16 plus research that is tenuous and limited. We have data from the community. I understand the limitations of that, of course, but still that are telling us overwhelmingly over 80%. And then there's study, the, the research done on FLE teachers or even just employees in our own survey is overwhelming, 88% of our employees and then 81% in the FLE staff specifically. I guess I, I just, what is pushing this? Like why are we doing this if that's what we, the data we have? All of it has limitations, but we also have no other information and everything else is telling us no. So. Can someone help me understand, like, what is the push? Where is it coming from and why? So I, I think some of the, the data, right, wasn't nuanced. And I think the committee looked at it and looked at some of the overarching concerns that families had about kids feeling awkward, right, and said, well, let's revise the, the recommendations and not start so young and let, some of, and let it happen at older ages. Like, we have combined... Um, we have combined FLE at grades 9 and 10. We can start that a little bit earlier, but let's not start it in fourth grade. So I think the committee didn't take it in, in the vein that maybe you're taking, considering you know we have 2,000 submissions, which is a lot of submissions for a community review, but we have a much larger community as a whole. They took that as a signal that perhaps these recommendations were, were um, you know, a bridge too far, and maybe we could revise them and build up to that. So that's, that is the best way, and, and, and Ms. Reynolds, feel free to, to add anything to it, but I think that's how they um, interpret it. Much of the conversation on the committee, particularly from our public health our, um, experts, our health department representatives, really talked about the need to 
normalize instruction, make sure that all students understand all genders um, and receiving it together. And I would also share when we talked with our students, especially our elementary students, there a lot of them were like, were saying they sit in those classes wondering, are they hearing the same information in the other class? Like, I'm a girl, are the boys hearing what I'm experiencing? And they're concerned that their peers don't really understand, they don't know what is happening to them. And that was something that we did hear um, multiple times from, from students, a lot of curiosity about what was happening. Um, so while they were concerned, and there was that you know, embarrassment, awkwardness, you know, they weren't sure, there was also questioning as to what was happening in the other classroom my time, but I'll take a go back if we're doing them. Yeah, I'll put you on for go back. So I'll go ahead and take my turn before we go to go backs. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate sort of the thoughtfulness on taking some more time to sort of do look at the um, pacing guides, the, the research, all these other things that you talked about. I think it's important to do this right, um, you know, and, and to take the time to, to do it in that way. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the consent pieces. Um, I really appreciate the work on consent. As I think um, Ms. Tolan said, you go to colleges and it's very much zero tolerance around a lot of issues. And I think we need to build that capacity. Um, there was a lot about teaching how to say no bodily autonomy, which I think is very, very important, right? But there's only one line that I saw, and I, I don't have it in front of me, about what to do if somebody else says no. And I think that's a really important piece at a lot of levels, not just what, what I think it didn't say what to do, I apologize. I think it said what it means when someone says no. Super important, right? But then what was missing was what to do, right? And I think that's really important too, to understand your own body autonomy and consent for yourself, what it means when someone else, or what it looks like when someone is giving consent or not giving consent, but also then what do you do? Because we are, you know, we need to teach that piece too. What's the replacement behavior? And I think we need to, I mean, just, I know you're all shocked. We need to do that from a neurodivergent lens as well as a neurotypical lens, right? Because what consent looks like for somebody who's neurodivergent might be different. What understanding of what someone else's consent or lack of consent looks like may be different and what to do may be different. So I think it's that piece, I, I cannot emphasize enough that it has got to be done, you know, one in 35 just with autism. And there's a lot of um, research around the criminal justice impacts of not getting this right. So I just wanted to lay that out there that I think I would agree with Dr. Reed going back and looking at consent a little bit deeper for the younger grades as well as, I think that's so important. I don't see that work here yet. So I'll, my time's up, I can take go back. But if you want to comment, I'd appreciate that. We, I mean, the, the committee did try to spiral some of those concepts and come back to the, you know, con what consent means, what it looks like over and over. We do have, I believe, in both the upper elementary and the middle school, you know, when we're saying hearing and respecting no, I, that, that I think is what, you're, is what you're talking about as well. So if somebody says to you no, they don't agree, they don't consent to this, like, what do you do? How do you respond? What's appropriate and inappropriate? And that would come out in the lesson maybe more than it's coming out in the objective and the descriptive statement. Um. Thank you, um, and I'll respond to that Mike go back, so thank you. All right, we have um, three go back so far. Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I think you've heard my concerns and I, uh, regarding um, proceeding as you've suggested for the six through eight. Um, of particular concern is if we are going to go ahead and develop, uh, develop pacing guides and other information, then we are essentially giving a signal that we're going down a path without actually having, um, having come to that agreement. And I think that it's important that we look at ensuring that we have that dual path that if we want to either trial it, but I would actually suggest we can have combined classrooms for those that want to opt into combined classrooms and separate classrooms for those that want to keep the status quo for six through eight. You read this documentation, um, there's no, nothing that says this is that we should be immediately going uh, to gender combined. The second thing is regarding the um, consent, I am all for increased 
um, education on consent, and I would suggest, as uh, Mr. Frisch has suggested, that it needs to start earlier. Um, we, we see behaviors happening as early as um, early elementary schools, so that consent piece is critical. Um, and I do think we should also tie it in with some of the education on Title IX. What I don't see here is the bystander intervention. And the previous board did a lot of work on bystander intervention of what happens when you see somebody whose consent is not there and they're still facing, a facing an aggression. How do other people step in to help? And that was something the previous board agreed and this was gonna happen. So where does that fit? We do have bystander intervention in our high school lessons so these objectives were k through eight and it does not fall currently in those objectives or in the recommendations but it is in the high school lessons i think it's an equal part of consent and needs to be included in there um and, uh, can i just comment one other thing you know historically we have um uh, gone through the process, the board has voted and approved, and then we start all the work, right? We write the curriculum, we do that. We haven't um, done that. I think Dr. Reed was probably considering that if we did some of that, it would maybe give more information about you all making the decision, not to presuppose a decision. So what is the downside of actually going a parallel path? The, uh, the parallel path of students? Yeah. Um, having, um, so some of it, we've talked a little bit about that and, and um, you know, we've worked on like what would that look like and what would the steps be and um, there's a scheduling, right, just for the school to figure out how to make that work. Um, there, and maybe this is just my interpretation and in talking to, you know, some of the students I know, that sort of feeling, which room did you go in? Did you go in the, the boys' room, the girls' room, the combined room? Like that, the awkwardness at the school level for the student. And then the parents who said, I wanted my child in this room, but the child actually went in the other room. And you know, there becomes a little bit of a complication. Not saying it's not possible. Certainly it's possible to do a parallel. But just trying to think about how that actually is um, implemented in a school and the considerations. Well, we have in seventh and eighth separate um, girls and boys um, health classes and uh, health and PE. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Dr. Reed, did you want to add to that? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I want to elaborate on Ms. Clemenko's comment. I, part of the reason why we feel like we need to do a little more study and a little more work before we come back to you is what would those models look like? And as we think about um, in particular, you know, 141 elementary schools and the nuances in the sizes and schedules and the complexity of that, as well as our middle schools. Um, we really want to make sure when we come back and if we're talking about multiple tracks, both uh, gender combined, gender separate, and of course then the opt out of the instruction completely. So really three tracks. So we want to make sure we're able to staff those models um, in a thoughtful way so that we have safe spaces for students uh, to learn this curriculum or be part of this work or if their families opt them out to also have spaces um, for the opt out. But that's really work that hasn't been uh, done yet. So that's part of this in terms of looking at all these schedules and how that could be possible. So I think that's something that's part of this uh, work we would wanna come back to the board with in the fall. So to be clear, you're not precluding coming Corbett back Santa, with multiple can, models. Oh, heavens no. Okay, because yeah. that's... No, I think what we want to look at is what the models are. I don't believe I heard that staff are not, they're not wanting to preclude it. I think they're, we're seeing challenges to it, potentially, but I know we can overcome those. So we need to be able to come back with those scenarios. Um, okay. It's not how we've done it in the past, but it's, it's something we're going to need to look at. I understand that. So... Um, we do need to take a look at that, which is why I wanted to make sure we elaborated on that this evening. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I, I can put you on a go, go back if you want. Just clarify brief, quickly. Um, I think what Ms. Corbett Sanders was saying at the end was um, our health and physical education courses at middle school are gender separate, which is not true. Um, they, uh, boys and girls are together in health and physical education. They only separate for the four days when they're receiving the human growth and development lessons. Thank you. Um, 
Ms. McLaughlin? Yeah, I, I, I do want to emphasize again, Dr. Presidio, my question originally had been, what is the research at the elementary school level? And it's my understanding that that is almost non-existent. And so I appreciate that you were trying to say there's research, but my statements had been accurate in saying we don't have it at the elementary school level. And I think that's really important. Um, Dr. Reed, I think at this point what I'm struggling with is that we have so many challenges facing this system. And right now, our community has not said, as a whole, and I've been on this board 12 years, and I've not had people coming to me and saying, when are you going to fix this about how you're delivering FLE? So I have been passionate about FLE. Um, my twin sister, who's a nursing professor and a research expert, was very progressive as my representative. Um, but I also know that it is so important that if we're going to survey our families and we believe that we know what's best, then inform people with the research first, then survey them. I say this on every survey. Don't ask people to, to their opinions in a vacuum where they don't have information, and then we want to discount it. So, and I also think that in general, Mr. Frisch is right. If we, if we are going to say that these survey responses matter, then we need to do them more scientifically. This is such a shame that we're racing to have this conversation. Um, but I do want to say to staff, as always, I appreciate you are coming at this with your best intentions. So if I'm sounding critical, it is not because I don't respect your commitment to doing good work. Thank you. Ms. Amesh? Yeah, um, so I guess this whole thing is awkward, no matter how you teach it or what, uh, is just something to keep in mind. But, okay, so, so here's the reality, right? We obviously know this is an issue. A lot of people land in different places. The problem came because some students didn't feel respected, affirmed, included in the current setup. So then the question becomes, okay, how do we find a solution for those students without necessarily flipping the whole thing on its head in a way that clearly the you know, community is not interested in. So maybe we can be a little bit more creative. I think looking at models is, is one direction. The other possibility is these could be online modules. We could do this in a way, I mean, we're trying to incorporate e-learning and all that stuff anyway. We could have these be something students are required to do individually with, you know, maybe there's reflection time, maybe there isn't. We can think that through, but that's also an option. Um, you know, I, I think w rather than kind of making this push and pull in two different directions, we can try to generate ideas that ensure we approach it with compassion, but also with intellectual integrity. You know, uh, I, I think consider the online thing. I look forward to seeing other possible models, but I really think that's a potential way out of this uh, whole mess. But just, just my two cents. Um, I'm trying to remind us, again, being compassionate and not dismissive of anyone's perspective. Thank you. Before I go to Mr. Frisch. So the students who, you know, this part of this centers around are not necessarily in a position to self-advocate, nor are they necessarily in a position where um, their selection would not out them to their classmates. I think that needs to be said. Um, and so when we have these conversations, we need to accept that they exist. They exist in every demographic we have, every faith tradition that we have. They exist in every race that we have. They represent every gender. Um, they are tall, they are short, they are plump, they are skinny. They are every kid we have in our system. There is a kid that is represented in that group. And we know about some of them and we don't know about some of them. And some of them want us to know about them and some of us some of them don't want us to know about them. And so as we navigate these waters, I think it's important to remember that those students exist, that they are real, that trans boys are boys and trans girls are girls and they deserve the same um, services from FCPS as anybody else. Thank you, Mr. Fish, Ms. Marin. Thanks, so what I'm craving here is consistency. So one is that I do share um, 
the interest in any time a new instructional practice is rolled out way before the staff have to be surveyed. They have to be distinctively um, sought for their input in a very uh, consistent way. We've now done a lot over the last year or two on very consistent community engagement practices. What is the model that the division will use any time some kind of significant instructional practice is changed? We've got to go to staff because all I hear from, not all I hear, but I often hear from staff is just one more thing and they're just piling stuff on. We got to get their input. Secondly, um, Dr. Reed, I would like, um, I don't know if it's the help of ORSI, our research department, or strategic communications, but I think the board really needs to be clear on its parameters for what it's going to accept as a level of research. Because in the last week alone, I've heard one parameter for strategic planning, there weren't enough comments, and in this parameter, we're taking 2,000 you know, uh, surveys and saying, we'll see that all these people disagree. The whole question of serving Mr. Frisch brought up, we've got to figure this out. I mean, this is like seriously like the 12th time we've had this conversation about 2,000 people is not represented, 20,000 not represented. What is the bar of this board that we're going to accept as representative data? Um, finally, I've taken my own straw polls. One fifth grade teacher said, please don't combine. Another sixth grade teacher said, it's fine. I asked a few principals. They were busy doing other things. like trying to keep kids in school. So, you know, I think if people are interested, they'll respond. We just did a huge community engagement piece. We've engaged. We will never be able to get everyone because people are just trying to survive. So I agree with this. If this is staff's recommendation, this is why we do these practices. It has been a year. We are not racing through anything. We have put this on hold from decision for at least a year. Mayor? So, yes. Thank you. Um, before I go to Google backs, Ms. Tolan, did you want to? Say anything more? Um, I'm just going to briefly say I think there's obviously a lot here. I think um, I appreciate staff wanting to be thoughtful in the fall. I think it's important um, to lift up also what Mr. Frisch said. I think it's important to lift up um, some of the words that we've heard around needing to engage staff. I think it's important to lift up needing to do this in a thoughtful way to have plans from, for Dr. Reed to bring back to us in the fall. So I think this is a good path forward recognizing that we want to make sure all of our kids find a place to belong. So um, that's really my only comment on, on this piece. I will say on consent, I'm just going to go back and say, well, I really appreciate that, that the committee did think about some of these pieces. What I was trying to lift up is I think it's such an important topic that in my experience in the 20 years that I've been raising special ed kids, advocating for special ed kids, 11 years I spent on ACSD, I don't think this conversation has nearly happened to the depth and understanding of what a neurodivergent experience is like and neurodivergent mindset is like. So I would ask strongly that you go back and really engage folks who understand it and include that in their consent because this is dangerous if we don't. Thank you. So if I could just very briefly comment on, on that before you close out. Um, I really appreciate those comments and suggestions, and that is really why we bring these recommendations to the board before we start developing any curriculum materials. We, we haven't even started that process yet, right? So those thoughts, those comments, those suggestions are the things that we use to incorporate and inform our future work. So I, I think your suggestions about that are definitely things that we can incorporate if the board approves <laughs> those, uh, those recommendations, then as we're developing the curriculum, we'd be happy to do that, so thank you. Thank you. I'll take a couple go-go backs and I'll respond to that in my turn. Carl, did you have a go-go back? Okay. Um, that's okay. Karen and then Megan. I've read and reread multiple times your um, lit survey. And there is a distinguished by age as to the appropriateness of combined versus single gender. Um, or, or the receptivity. And so when you come back with models, I would encourage that there is a deep dive into the research you've provided yourself. And also recognizing that we have elementary school, which goes through sixth grade, primarily throughout this whole county. So when you talk about making changes while kids are you know, at that elementary level, I read this um, lit, and it's not there. And so come back with some flexibility in modeling, 
come back with some your best thinking on it. And please, um, you know, I'm supportive of making sure every child feels safe and successful and well-educated in this, these critical areas. Thank but you, we Karen. have to do it in a thoughtful manner. Thank you, Karen. Megan? So I, I just want to emphasize, Dr. Reed, that in the absence of any real research at the elementary school level, um, I disagree with some on the board who think that, well, staff recommended it. The reason the board asked staff to not do the recommendations from this last year and to go out and get the research is because we wanted to make a research-based decision for this division of 180,000 kids. So I would say in the, la in the absence of research, what I also didn't like in the report is that what I saw was a listing of school divisions that are teaching it um, combined at a younger age. I didn't see school districts being listed out that look like us and are doing it the way we're doing it right now. And we know there's thousands of school districts. So um, I do appreciate that we gathered some for benchmarking, but and it's not exhaustive, but it would be helpful to see the ones that we also consider to be peers. And if they're all there, they're all there. Um, but I can't emphasize enough, there's nothing wrong with doing a pilot, given that the the general population in our school division has not been clamoring for this. I respect the FLE committee very much, but they are a very tiny group of 19 members. And we don't have the research to help drive this decision at this moment in time. Thank you, and I'll just say, Dr. Presida, I really appreciate those comments and, and lifting it up, but I will say sometimes what is written is what gets done. So just my two cents on that piece, and I, and I appreciate you lifting it up. I just wanted to put that out there, that you know, if it's not written, it doesn't get done, and it has been, in my opinion, an oversight for a long time, or, or perhaps something that just hasn't been as, as, maybe I shouldn't say oversight, let me rephrase, there hasn't been as much awareness, perhaps, as the urgent need for it. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, for, for consent, the, sorry, the, can be clear, the consent piece on you know, the urgent need for really recognizing the different perspectives on the consent piece of it. And I just would urge that what's written gets done. So I would love to see when you come back in the fall, maybe, I know you don't want to change FLECAC recommendations, but your follow-up to have more explicit around that piece. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yeah, yes, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think one of the things that, I mean, this is clearly a difficult topic, right? We're all wrestling with this. The research um, is not abundant, nor is it clear. And I think what is clear is that I believe we have a shared interest in each and every student having a safe space to learn what's critical health information. And safe is, def I mean, safe is just going to be safe, right? We need it to be safe for students that have all perspectives and families who do. Um, it needs to be safe for our trans students, our gender fluid students, our cis students, our students who um, have beliefs that um, are, and all of our students and families have beliefs that are across the board. So I think that's, that's why the models we choose to present this have to be really carefully thought through because I believe um, that when we talk about each of our students being seen, heard, and affirmed, and learning the skills they need to be successful when they leave our division, um, I think that's a shared interest. So I don't want to lose what we believe together. So it's going to be incumbent on us to think about how do we provide those models that don't uh, leave students feeling unsafe or staff feeling unprepared um, or families feeling unheard. Um, and we also know that Honestly, majority doesn't always um, dictate, right? Because we have to be concerned about what keeps each person safe, whether they're um, in that majority or not. So I just, those are, I think, just things that I want to remind myself about and remind us about that uh, that's, that's really at the core of this conversation. And I know with the people around this table and the people working on this, we're going to get there. Um, but it's also, I think, something we don't rush this evening, and it's something we really, we've taken some steps to be thoughtful about, and we have some more work to do 
Um, and as this is a topic, these lessons are not taught till later in the year next year. It's, it's also not, um, you know, setting us way behind. It's just, I think, a really important time to, to pause, be thoughtful about what our options are, and then come back to the table uh, with more information. So I just want to be clear about that. Thank you. Um, Aurora, I saw your placard go up. Do you want to go, go back before we finish? I was trying to get your attention. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, no, it's fine. I mean, I, I, I think Dr. Reed shared actually a lot of the sentiment. I think the idea is this can actually turn into a really unifying process. I think if we, you know, spend the time, and, and that's what dialogue enables, right. I think, in being able to have this conversation uh, and recognize that absolutely, you know, transgender students should feel safe and affirmed and valued at the same time. Uh, we're mindful of what realities are for all kinds of kids, right? So that's the one piece. Um, and the fact that it shouldn't be up to one board member, too, to have to advocate for any particular group. But we, we all want to make sure that this works out for all kids. Um, just in closing, I didn't comment on the consent piece, but I, I'm very happy to see it. And I also wanted to build upon what Ms. Sizemore-Heiser said. I think that's critical. I think that's actually where we fall into a lot of mess when kids don't learn early on, not only kids with disabilities, but also kids about kids with disabilities uh, and how they communicate. So I would be a huge, I would hugely support adding the language in there and perhaps even more expansively about cultural responsiveness because you know, in some cultures, kissing is normal and like th things like that that might be taken differently. So maybe being um, more culturally resp responsive and certainly uh, neurodivergent aware about how we teach that to all kids, I think we'd all benefit. Thank you, Ms. Amish. And with that, I think I once had their turn. I'm just looking around for last minute placards before we, um, I want to thank you to, to you, the Fleet Act Committee, and to staff for really your thoughtful conversation today. And, and it is a difficult topic that we're trying to thoughtfully wrestle with. So thank you very much. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>